The title for tonight's podcast is Kerouac. Kerouac. Just another Tuesday. Happy Tuesday, podcast. Let's fucking do this thing. Come on, Slavinsky! Panelsonpages.com Podcast Network is here to cover all of your pop culture needs. Two words, nerd boner. From comics to television to movies to wrestling. Fuck wrestling. Your favorite PCN hosts will keep you entertained all week long. Boobs, boobs, boobs. Peen, peen, peen. Who put me in charge? <laughs> He's canceled. Subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Look for the pop stars on Facebook and Twitter. And be sure to join the forums and become a member of the population. Hey everyone, this is Andy. Before we start the 50 foot interview, I want to lay down some ground rules purely because I forgot to do it in the show. Plus, uh, listening back to the edit, there are a few specific rules that I need to put in place. Firstly, if you're listening to this, if you're a new listener, this show is very, very not safe for work. Um, anyone who's a regular listener, this show, this uh, episode is actually quite tame compared to what we normally do. Um, but anyone who's never heard us before, there is a little bit of swearing in here, so it might uh, not be suitable for work or for children or grandparents or whatever. Um, like I said, if you've... Um, after after this interview, I'm going to put in a couple of clips of our ordinary show just to see, um, so you can kind of get an idea of what we're about and uh, and uh, see if you want to listen to the normal podcast too. That is the bit that will be very, very, very not safe for work. Um, so uh, anyone who's a regular listener, again, you will have heard this bef- uh, heard this stuff before. Um, secondly, uh, this show is this uh, specific show is very filled with spoilers i know i'm saying very a lot but hey deal with it um yeah this show is filled with a lot of spoilers so whenever you hear this sound fire the spoiler cannon that means there's a spoiler coming up so maybe um if you don't want to hear it skip forward uh, a minute or so that usually we've finished talking about it by then um so yeah other th- that's pretty much the only things i needed to uh i needed to men those are the only things i needed to mention before the show i'll uh stop talking gibberish and uh let let everyone enjoy so i may i present a 50 foot interview <laughs> Tower before our guests in a 50 foot interview. Hello and welcome to this attack of the 50 foot nerds interview. Uh, this is Andy, aka Bolts of Extoth. You know me, uh, from these other interviews. So it's. It's just me, which means it's either some music I found on the internet or something ridiculously metal. For this one, it's going to be both. Um, uh, joining me is uh, Brady. Say hello. Hello. All right. And uh, Brady is the drummer and uh, mastermind behind the band Lauren Guard. Uh, which, I'll be honest, uh, I came across you guys thanks to... Um, uh, there's uh, an internet series called uh, Frothy Pint of Metal. Oh, uh, right. <laughs> yeah, that, um, done by a bloke called Happy Viking, and uh, he did an episode about you guys. And uh, and uh, from that point, I was pretty much like, ooh, this looks really cool. Uh, so I decided to listen on, on YouTube, and then uh, you were doing the Kickstarter for uh, for the, the, uh, the book of Eve of Corruption. Mm-hmm. So I figured, hey, let's uh, let me uh, donate some money to this, and then, yeah, things yeah, we went appreciate from there. That, yeah. Yes, but um, enough about me. Let's talk about you. Uh, yeah, so let's start at the beginning, shall we? Uh, what? How did Lauren Guard come to be? Um, well, it's actually interesting because I was uh, playing drums for a. <laughs> I know this sounds weird. I was playing drums for a goth industrial hybrid band. And this was like when I was kind of right out of high school and I was taking some time off college, just, you know, playing music, 
I was in a few thrash bands, but then I, I hit hit the big time, quote unquote, and got involved in this touring band um, that was based out of Indianapolis, Indiana. And uh, my brother and I both played in there for about a year, I think. But the whole time I was I was pretty miserable because it just the music wasn't my thing. Um, it was good to have a working gig, but uh, I still hadn't really found my like real direction with music because. Uh, I, you know, I grew up on Metallica, and I was involved in a lot of like Metallica cover bands in high school, and um, kind of got sick of like the angry metal. You know, it was just like everything I was listening to, I just didn't really relate to too much because it was all just you know angry stuff. And then I, in high school, I stumbled upon this um, album by Hammerfall called Legacy of Kings. Ah, uh, okay. CD store, <laughs> and I had never heard of anything remotely like that because like power metal was foreign to me, so. Um, when I picked that up, and like it kind of reignited my love for fantasy, which I kind of tried to work against when I was high school. It wasn't cool, you know, in high school to to like fantasy and be involved in all the nerdery, which I later grew to embrace. But, um, but yeah, yeah it kind of reignited my love for that. So, um, so I slowly got into power metal through that. It took me a few years to finally discover the bands that really spoke to me. Like Rhapsody was a big one. Um, Hey, long story short, um, playing all this uh, in, the, in this goth band uh, kind of made me, you know, re- reacquaint myself with power metal, and I got more into that and started writing fantasy um, stories and stuff because a lot of the bands I listened to was all they all had you know concepts behind their albums. So yeah, yeah, Rhapsody kind of had a, like yeah. m- massive thing about uh, concepts in there. So yeah, definitely. definitely. Yeah. And oddly enough, like um, the, the band that really got me, like that really kicked me into gear. It's weird it's still for me to think about, but Freedom Call, they have this uh, um, album called Eternity, okay. and um, it's pretty straightforward power metal, but for some reason it was like, I was like, I-, I need to do this, you know, and like, even though there wasn't a strong theme behind that one, that, like, like listening to that album, I started writing the the, the origins of Warren Guard, like the story itself, so oh, I guess, okay. you know, some little seeds of inspiration there, but then, um, but yeah, um, Adam and I, um, I finally convinced him to come on board with my idea to start a power metal band, and we put some, you know, Put, made some noise on the internet, on some forums and stuff, trying to find anybody locally. And we got the attention of this guy, uh, Chris Cruz, who was the uh, drummer of Demiricus, and they, they were assigned to Metal Blade. But he was actually looking to play guitar for Power Metal. He loved uh, Rhapsody also, which was crazy to me, because I didn't know they were that big, you know, especially in Indiana. But, um, but yeah, we met up, and that was in, I think it was 2004, I believe, when we started jamming together. Cool. So yeah, that's that's my my short story of how the band got started. <laughs> nice. So um, it kind of leads me on to my other question as well, which was um, if uh, it started out as just the band and going, okay, what should we sing about? I know, let's come up with a storyline, or the storyline came first, and then it was like, okay, time to form a band around this. Mm. Yeah, I think the the, the discussion we had um, it was me, just me, Adam, and Chris, just the three of us when we started writing a couple songs and developing the idea of what the band would be. And um, I remember having a conversation with Chris because <clears throat> I was kind of apprehensive with some of my ideas. I have a lot of ambitious ideas, and I gotta like you know filter them out sometimes. So I was talking to Chris like you know do do we want to be a concept band you know that has like a heavy story behind it, like Rhapsody, or do we want to just you know maybe have concept albums where each album is a different type of you know fantasy setting or something but he was pretty strong in the of the opinion of having just the band be like itself just one big ip the band is a theme the characters in the band are actually characters in the story um, that's so, like, who that, came up with that yeah that was kind of his like incur and like encouragement because i had a lot of stuff you know i had ideas for these things but i didn't think anybody else wanted to do that because i thought it was like way out there but he kind of you know he convinced me that we should do that and like immediately i started just you know getting ideas together about like <laughs> it's funny because because the the hard part was I had a story, but having a story with like seven different main characters was the tricky part. <laughs> so I had to kind yeah. of the kind of take a step back and reapproach the story in a new way after making that decision. Yeah, well, um, I mean, uh, how much of the uh, of the the actual character versions of yourselves did you actually draw from the members of the band anyway? Because I know it's like. Um, you and uh, Adam, your uh, your characters, Riken and uh, Sebastian, are both twins as well, and it's just mm-hmm. like, and presumably the way that they work together is kind of the way you two work. Yeah, that's something I, I kind of wanted to infuse. Like, it's it's kind of hard to take straight personalities of of the band members because a lot of guys, you know, like you know, it's 
you have to kind of embellish things in fantasy, make them like make character flaws really stand out. Yeah. So yeah. like for example, like um, like one of Raken's big things, my character is uh, he uses a comedy to like kind of you know shield himself from serious stuff. He doesn't like to get too serious, and I have that problem with a lot of my personal interactions with people. I kind of like tend to just to make things into jokes as opposed to you know making them too serious. So I kind of just embellish that even more to this character, and that's his big flaw. And like my brother, he's like he's self righteous a lot, so we made him a freaking priest, you know. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that kind of played it pretty well. But like some of the other characters, like Chris, for example, Chris is a super sweet dude. Like he's a really nice guy, super creative, but his character is this like dark, you know, half dragon guy. So like I had to kind of, you know, superimpose a lot of uh, personalities onto this guy that maybe wasn't there. So there, there are some disconnects, but I try to at least, you know, have some of that person in those characters. And, they, and I, I ask for them for inspiration to see what they want their character to be like. So. Ah, fair enough. It's like one or the other, you know. Ah, so, um, uh, which is also why uh, you guys dress up as the characters while performing. Yeah, yeah. And that's something, too, like, I, I was kind of apprehensive about because um, I'm not a huge, like, I know cosplaying is a big thing these days, but I've, I've never been one to, like, really dress up a lot or, like, you know, be all about costuming and stuff like that. But, but Chris was pretty adamant about it. He just thought that that'd be... A great, especially in the local scene here in Indiana, you got these guys that show up to a bar to play a show, and they're doing their sound check and their metal shirts, and all of a sudden they come out to play, and they're wearing all this like crazy fantasy clothes. It's a good way to slap people in the face and say, "Hey, check this out real quick," you know. Yeah, so, yeah. so it kind of there's kind of a double a, a two way street where it's like we wanted to do it just because we want to really invoke that theme, but also because it makes people kind of be like, "Oh, what?" And then they'll you know kind of take they'll, they'll listen a little more if you have some exaggerated theme going on too. Yeah. It, it, um it draws people's attention more. Exactly, uh, yeah. Also uh, gives you the opportunity to play, like, because uh, you've played um, different festivals. Um, uh, well, I say festivals. You've played places that have not been, like, metal gigs and shit like that as well, haven't you? Yeah, there's, there's some. We, we try, we want to really. Uh, pursue that more like we're, we're looking at ways to, to play some of the bigger conventions like gen con or like you know anywhere that, that would be have these you know conventions where co- people are cosplaying and stuff it's like the perfect place for us to get some exposure um we're still working on that like just recently that we played um i'm from lafayette indiana originally and lafayette just held their very first uh, uh excuse me a convention it's called TippyCon, um and that was uh pretty successful actually for their first year but we played the after party so it was kind oh, of like, okay. you know, finally playing to my people, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> so that was, that was pretty fun. That's uh, that's where the uh, the video for the the new song uh, was recorded, isn't it? Yeah, that, yeah, that's the yeah, the sound there was was great. So we tried to get as much video as we could there. Cool. Um, let's see. So um, w- one thing I've got to say to people if they are listening and they haven't read the book yet, uh, uh, while we're talking about that is. Uh, read read the novel as well because um, I remember w- w- uh, listening to the uh, the album first and thinking, oh, this is really cool power metal. And then I read through the entirety of Eve of Corruption and went back to the album, and it just adds an extra dimension to it because now you're listening to the songs and going, oh yeah, I know that character and I know <laughs> that character, and right. oh yeah, I know this uh, this is that chapter and blah blah. And one of the things I do like about it is the fact that the track listing is kind of the same sort of order that things happen in the book. Yeah, there's a there's a loose chronology there that we tried to emphasize because and that kind of that was kind of a struggle during the production of the album because we had a lot of different ideas about what songs come in what order. But I, I'm over there like, wait guys, wait, that doesn't make sense because this happens first, this happens before that. And <laughs> I had to like mix things up, and I know Chris is kind of getting a headache over that because Chris is very meticulous about the musical side of things. Oh yeah, he's like the main songwriter, and he has a very specific way he wants things delivered. So me back there saying, hey, this character does this instead gets really annoying for him. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I I, well, that's, that's good to hear that that gave you that extra layer. Because that's actually the the whole idea I try to push is like you know if if you if you like music and you like books and this is exactly where you need to be because it's it's trying to marry the two you know and I it's I'm surprised that it's not done more often. I know there are some bands that kind of flirt with it like Rhapsody has little notes in their in their booklets about you know all the story, but it's not really. It doesn't really give you the sense of being in there, and that's yeah, why yeah, I decided no. to pick up a pen and actually try to write a novel because I think that that's the best way to get really invested in that world. Ah, okay. So, um, so it was uh, just Lorengard itself that inspired you to become a writer 
Yeah, you know. there's yeah, there was some there was some things I was working on before Lauren Guard started that a lot of it became I, I turned it into Lauren Guard once it started. So I was working on a few different ideas for books, mostly like I was doing some just you know half ass D and D fiction because you know how Dungeons and Dragons puts out all those novels in based yeah, on their yeah. settings. I would just you know dick around with some of their settings and mess with characters in there, but I didn't never took it too seriously. But I did actually start writing because of metal. Like I didn't actually read too many books or write much on my own after school. But like when I got into metal, I just started picking up you know Wheel of Time, Game of Thrones. I started reading books like crazy and then I just that kind of led to me wanting to write because I can't seem to do anything as a hobby without making it myself which is really frustrating because like if yeah. I'm playing games I'm like I gotta make a game now or if I'm you know listening to music I gotta make some music it's it's kind of a bitch sometimes <laughs> <laughs> you end up getting st- stuck in the thing where you're like oh this guy did re- really well I want to do something like that <laughs> yeah I can try that too <laughs> yeah, yeah no I, I, I completely understand that I'm pretty much the same uh, that in fact, with the um, with the track listing thing, that's uh, uh, one thing that uh, my my bandmates in Fornius have been uh, yelling at me for because we're we're um, uh, working on something, and I kept saying, "No, everything needs to be in this specific order." <laughs> oh, when 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 they're like, "But why?" My response was usually, "Don't question my heart." <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's hard when you have a specific thing that you hear in your head. And yeah. You're like you, you think it needs to be delivered that way. Just no other opinions matter. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Because um, that's the the one thing I can imagine would be a struggle with Lauren Guard, especially seeing as you've got six other guys in the band to sort of yeah. bounce things off, and you're like, yeah, but it needs to be this way. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> Speaking of the uh, the other guys as well, like uh, how. Uh, I know you mentioned you got uh, you got Chris from um, from the internet basically, mm-hmm. and um, how did you uh, end up running into the rest of the guys? Like, because um, it, it's just it a sense. massive pile of like really talented people. <laughs> yeah, we we were really fortunate. We have, I mean, I, I was surprised by how many musicians kind of you know flocked to this band because it's just it's kind of a weird band i guess that's kind of working in its favor though because there's a lot of the same going around with local bands so when you have a band like lauren guard looking for musicians you kind of get more attention because it's so different than what people are used to seeing around here oh, so okay. that, that that helps a lot you know and also it's just a lot of really good musicians are attracted to this style of music because it just it requires so much you know but it's still it's still got the poppy listen listenability but it still requires a lot of technical prowess so um, so it specifically, like, for example, our, our other guitar player, Dave Schneider, he, um, he actually approached us because we were, we were just having, we just had one guitar player at the time. Chris had left the band because he was touring with Demircus. So we had another guitar player, TJ Hunt, who was, um, kind of just the, the one guitar player we had. And during that, that era of the band, Dave approached us because he was a huge fan. He was a younger guy in okay. his teens and, and he was like, Hey guys, I, I love your stuff. If you ever need another guitar player, let me know. And I'm like, Hey, yeah, we actually do need a guitar player. And he came with a lot of enthusiasm. Oh, okay, cool. So it was kind of a natural transition to, to bring him on board. And um, he stuck around. Like, we had a lot of uh, sh- changing going on at that time, but he stuck around through all that. And actually, there was a point during this uh, process where it was actually just me, Adam, and Dave were the only band members left because everybody else had wanted to do other things. Mm. So around that time is, like, is when Chris came back on board, and we kind of like started the phase two of the band. And um, that kind of it, that involved getting Alec Bickham on board. Alec was a... Uh, as a student at the same college I was attending, and um, I actually was like stalking people on Facebook. I was just <laughs> typing in keyboards, you know, like who who comes up with keyboards. This is before Facebook changed their their search settings, and now you can't do that kind of stuff because it's too creepy. But I did it. <laughs> so I found this dude with like super long hair. He's a t- total physics nerd, and I was like, hey, this guy might be what we're looking for. And uh, we, Adam and I went to his dorm to hang out with him, and he was like, you know, just super weird and eccentric and he had like every instrument in his uh, his little dorm room he was playing these little guitars and stuff and a little violin he just he was amazing but then he, he took us down to the lobby of the dorm and played on this big grand piano in front of a bunch of people just hanging out and we're like holy shit this guy needs to be in our band so he's uh he he jumped on board too pretty enthusiastically and he was really excited about you know we have a really orchestra orchestral band and he loves orchestration mm. and stuff so he was a natural fit also yeah, I, was, I was gonna say it sounds very like uh, listening to your influences and uh, and stuff, like especially there's a section in the song "Upon the Burning Isles" mm-hmm. the, the, with the bit the bit where um, 
it sort of goes uh, like it has like really orchestrated and there's the spoken word and everything. You're just like, oh my god. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's funny because he'll just crap those things out like overnight mm. and say, hey guys, I got this. What do you think of this? And he'll do like some of it in the studio, just like on the whim. Like Chris says, oh, I need this kind of section, and Alec will just lay it down in one take. It's like, what the. What are you, man? Like, what are you made of? <laughs> yeah, it's... So he's he's pretty incredible, um, and he's just a fantastic musician and a super nice guy, and uh, he's great to have around. And then um, we have uh, Rob, who's the the final key element. We had a um, our original singer back in um, back in the early days for our first demo, um, the of Tales to Come demo, which has got some really bad production on it. <laughs> but um, our original singer, Rob Stith, was um, someone we met also in the college I was attending and um he was a great uh great dude super enthusiastic um he just he didn't he had a lot of things that didn't click very well with the band because he had he was he's super driven also to the point where it's kind of conflicts with what the the greater cause is for Lauren Guard so like he had a lot of ideas that just weren't meshing with what what the rest of the band wanted to do and it kind of oh, okay. became just this like it, it kind of came counterproductive, so um, we actually looked for somebody who was more in line with what we wanted to do, and um, this name that kept keep com- kept coming up for me was um, Rob Graves, and uh, he he was a singer for this band Winterfell, which I had met on the road when I was playing with that goth band, right. and um, Winterfell, of course, was like a, a – Rob is responsible for get, getting me into Game of Thrones because we were just like internet buddies after I met his band. And um, I saw that they liked Blind Guardian and stuff, so I was like, oh, yeah, I love you guys. Um, and he got me into some of the fiction that really shaped how I wrote. So, like, we kind of stayed connected through that. We had a mutual love for, for George mm-hmm. R. Martin. But um, when, when we were looking for a singer, uh, his band had broken up, so he was actually free. And I always joked with him about starting up a band called High Garden, <laughs> which is taken from a, it's a different castle in, in Game of Thrones because his band is Winterfell. I thought it was fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, we, uh we kept joking about that, but then I was like, well, you know what? We, we need a singer, so like, let's maybe let's try you singing for Lauren Guard. And yeah. I wasn't sure he'd dig it because it's a little geekier than what he was doing because Winterfell is kind of serious, like Ice Earth type stuff. Like, yeah. it's more, you know, kind of darker approach, but um, but he, he, was no, all, like, he was all about it. Yeah, it, it's yeah. like it's like the Game of Thrones books themselves yeah, compared, yeah. To, compared to the Lauren Guard stuff. So it's it's uh, after reading Eve of Corruption, I myself just started on a Game of Thrones. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it, um, uh, you guys have more the... It's like the Game of Thrones is more of the, the dark sort of stuff, whereas Lauren Guard's more... I don't, it, does it make sense to say it's more hopeful? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> if yeah, that I makes so. any sense. It's, it's, it's more heroic. Like it's got that sense of heroism. That yeah, yeah, is like present and like you in said, Game the high thrones. <laughs> yeah, like you said, the high fantasy Dungeons and Dragons sort of yeah angle. And, oh. Yeah, and that, that's one of the ways that Rob and I differ because Rob is very gung ho with like the Game of Thrones uh, style. Like that's his. Like that's made for him. He's like the perfect audience for that, and I love it. I think it's fantastic, and it really did a lot to um, uh, kind of. Uh, change how I approach writing fiction, but at the same time, I'm also a fan of like classical myth, and I, I like the hero, the heroism, you know, and, and I like a lot of stuff that he would consider cheesy, or a lot of uh, Game of Thrones fans would find, you know, just traditional fantasy. I I embrace that kind of stuff, but I I mean I have a wider palette, I think. So, ah, uh, fair enough. Yes. Although, um, speaking of Game of Thrones, one question that I was going to ask you that actually relates to it was. Um, with the um, with the uh, uh, the naming of everything, like where do you get the ideas for all the character names and the place names and all of that sort of stuff? That uh, I kind of just take inspiration from a lot of different things. Um, like it's weird because I'll, I'll pour off my old notes when I'm um, thinking of story stuff. I have this like huge notebook full of old Thorneyard stuff, and it's funny because when I was doing my like the most the, the final draft of View of Corruption, um, I was borrowing names from a lot of older things like. Um, it's the character Anathu, for example. I love that name, Anathu. But it's weird because I look at these old notes, and Anathu was the name of a of a continent. <laughs> it's some old map I had. I just had this little island called Anathu, and I think I just stole that at one point and used that for Chris's character's name. So I thought it just sounded cool as a name. So like yeah. I just I have a lot of just I have like a repository of names and shit that I would just I mean as a big gamer myself I play D and D and stuff like that. So I'm always mm. just coming up with names for things, and that's one of my favorite parts about world building is I just love naming stuff. So like I remember 
before my my daughter was born, I had this big list of names. Most of them were horrible, but it's like kind of a it's kind of a curse because I just want to I just want to think of all these different weird names for things, and I have trouble settling on one sometimes. Well, and then the wife's like, "No, <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> we're not going to name her Sorsha." <laughs> I had the exact same problem with my with my ex wife and my son. Oh yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we we rejected the name because uh, she started throwing out names and sh- um, she suggested Luke, but then immediately threw it out when my response was. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "God damn it!" <laughs> but speaking of keeping on the the sort of Dungeons and Dragons and burn that theme, um, like that's one of the thing. Like, well, kind of. Um, that's one of the things that, that came with the with the Kickstarter thing that I got. Like, you, you actually got a full map of uh, yeah, yeah. of yeah. Uh, that's Lawrence. Thanks to, uh, thanks to Rob, our uh, our singer. He's actually really into. I mean, he likes drawing in general. He's a big art mm. guy. He started off drawing a lot of uh, comic book stuff, and and he's actually working on a graphic novel for Eve of Corruption. Um, one of like you know the thousand projects we're trying to juggle around right now. But <laughs> but um, yeah, he he uh, he kind of took that map that he drew for the book, the interior. It's a little black and white map, mm. and he's like, we should have this for a reward, and you know, make it blown up and everything. And he started messing with it. And he took like you know about a week and a half or two weeks and just kind of went crazy and made this huge colored, you know, ridiculously amazing detailed map. So, so yeah, I thought that was pretty awesome that he went, he went the extra mile for that. And it's stuff like that we want to keep doing where it's just, they're little tiny, you know, they're not, they're not a huge deal. You can't like make a ton of money selling them a, a map art, but it's like a piece of a bigger puzzle that people can really get into the world and, and, you know, feel like they're, yeah, yeah. they're exploring this larger IP. Yeah. It's like, um, one one thing I, I I was doing with it was basically after I read the book, start going around looking for all the places that I'd seen, <laughs> and uh, and like looking at places, going, oh, they haven't mentioned that yet. I wonder where this comes in. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And it's like um uh to go back to the I, I know I'm jumping about subjects all over the place. Oh, that's fine. I will yeah. also go. Yeah, feel free. <laughs> oh no, the, um, any of our regular listeners will will know that uh, our show is very rarely linear. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> so yeah, no, we're all over the place. Although I, I have to admit, more often than not, very very dark. Uh, <laughs> so we're keeping it tame today. Um, <laughs> yeah, no. Um, to go back to the the music um, as well with. Um, Eve of Corruption. When you were like, how did you guys bounce off uh, ideas off each other musically for writing this stuff for Eve of Corruption? Because presumably uh, the uh, you've, by the looks of it, you've done the same. Uh, you've uh, like got completely new songs on Eve of Corruption compared to the demo. Right. So yeah. it's like the like the demo seems more of a oh here's like little tales here and there of the of Lauren compared to the first al- album which is like story yeah in the in the name of the demo was pretty appropriate cuz it's like on tales to come because it's kind of us testing the waters of of what pieces of the world we want to explore and when the tales to come was written the the book was still it's like a second or third draft and even corruption the final draft was like draft twenty three or something like that so it changed oh, a lot from okay. you know from there there's just still the same characters at work like like I'll give you an example of how the band changes like the original singer Rob Stith his character was Donovan Marlowe and that character was was you know intended to be like a heroic type character but you'll know since you read the book you know that Donovan's yeah. kind of a like a not really a, a villain, but he's like the, a pawn of a the, shade. The villain. Yeah, so so he's uh, he's still in Spoilers. there. Spoilers. Yeah, yeah. Spoiler <laughs> alert. Um, but like, I, he's still in there. It's just it, we we changed his his path and kind of I tried to make it an organic shift instead of just removing him altogether, replacing him or something like that. I kind of wanted mm-hmm. to, to to stay with my original idea, but just kind of change what I had planned for him. So so the actual um, the actual writing songs from that story. Um, I used to want to develop a formula where it's like, well, I'll, I'll make a, uh, an outline, Chris, and you can write all the, all these riffs and all these song ideas based on this outline. But uh, and we did some, of, we did that to an extent. Like for Eve, a lot of the time, I would, you know, give Chris an outline of the story, and he would come up with ideas musically of that mood or whatever that so, that so part of the story and captured. Yeah. Um, but like the more we did that, the more I kind of didn't want to do like 
one way for every song. I didn't want to like just make a formula of how we wrote songs. So we kind of would approach songs different. Like he might bring a riff in on a part of a song. I'd be like, oh, this would be perfect for this part of the story. And I might not have intended that to be a song on the album, but because he had the awesome piece of music already, we just kind of made it work, you know? So, so it was, uh, we did a lot of different ways, but I think the majority of the time it would be, we would sit down, I would email the guys a big outline of what I thought the, the songs should be and the parts of the story. And then we would change stuff from there. We were just like, you know, back and forth, different ideas from there. Oh, okay, cool. So it's like, and uh, lyrically, you had, you clearly had the, the novel written first. And then once you went, oh, this part of the novel will work with this song, you wrote the lyrics about that part of the story. Right, yeah. And and with the lyrics, like, like for example, a lot of Eve, um, we had most of, probably 80% of Eve written before Rob fully joined the band so a lot of the lyrics were things that i just scrapped together because i i can't sing I, I can't form great melodies and stuff like that but i can I, I feel like i have a good handle on lyrics themselves because i'm a huge fan of you know other bands lyrics and stuff like that yeah, and yeah. i i wrote lyrics ever since i started playing music even though i never really sang them so um i would have just like songs full of lyrics and rob could just pick and choose different themes he liked for lyrics and then he he wrote all of his own but he would have something to kind of build off of and, and convey certain ideas from. Um, I think the only real song that, like, for example, you know, Wrath Divine, like the choruses are pretty much, I think, all written by me because the, the, the melody stuck so hard it was hard to break away from. But Rob mm-hmm. would embellish him with his own, you know, different, different cho- choice of words and different placements and like that. And he wrote all the, the verses, but it's kind of just a... Uh, uh, a combination, you know, of, of where the the, stru- the structure of the original song, and then where we finally flesh everything out, and and it's it, it most of the time we come out pretty different, but Wrath was an it was an ex- example where it stayed pretty similar from the early drafts to the completion. Oh, okay, okay, cool. Uh, it's like um, right, did um, did uh, Rally have any involvement with it? What with him doing the uh, narrations and stuff? Uh, yeah, he he would um he had uh, if I pronounce his name on, correctly, I've, yeah, I've been, probably, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so far, like uh, half of the characters when we've been talking about them, you've pronounced them. I've been like, oh hell, <laughs> no, no, yeah, don't don't trust my. Pro- I can't even pronounce most stuff I write because I never say those words out loud. So oh, fair I enough. pronounce them weird. So don't worry about that. <laughs> People always ask me how do you pronounce them. I'm like I don't know how do you pronounce it. <laughs> but yeah, Raleigh's uh, Raleigh had a lot of. Um, of opinions on like diction of how he would say certain things. Like I, I mostly wrote all those narrations, but he would decide how to deliver them and everything. And oh. um, he, he, he does a lot of backing vocals on the album. Mm-hmm. They're kind of mixed in with the female vocals. Cause like they wanted to layer them really subtly, you know? So um, he, uh, he hasn't been playing with us since Eve released because well, since we all moved away, we all kind of, you know, went our own ways for a while. We tried to, the core members of the band tried to keep together and then keep doing things as we were apart. But when we got all back together now, it's just the six of us. It's just, just, uh, me, Adam, Rob, Chris, Dave, and Alec. So, um, so Raleigh's, we actually saw him at our recent show. He was actually running security for the venue because he's a, he's a bouncer. He's, he's a huge dude. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, we stay in touch with him and everything like that. We, and we probably will bring him back, uh, to do like, uh, spoken word stuff in the future if, he, if he's if he's willing and if he wants to, but um, yeah, we just since we're all based down in Indianapolis, we just uh, kind of carried on. Ah, uh, fair enough. Because that was one thing I was going to ask about, um, like uh, with the with the live shows, because I've only ever seen clips and stuff of you uh-huh. guys compared to a full show. Because like I obviously I live in England, so I can't really come to a gig, unfortunately. <laughs> Understandable. Uh, yeah, which. Uh, you guys need to play overseas. Um, yeah, they keep people keep telling us that. I'd love to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> Every time I play a show, someone would be like, why aren't you guys touring Europe? I'm like, ah, it's, it's, it's expensive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've, I've um, had, when I was interviewing Steam Power Draft, they said the exact same thing. Uh, yeah, it does seem like uh, touring somewhere that isn't your own country seems like a massive ball lake. I'm glad I haven't had to do it yet. <laughs> yeah. If if we had a like we we were on a distribution label right now with Cleopatra, mm-hmm. we have a deal with them. But if we were to ever get like a a full support deal from somebody who wants to tour, that's like well, that'd be my first you know stop is going to Europe because Europe and Japan is probably where we'll hit the he'll hit the best you know. But since we all have our own you know adult lives right now, it's like yeah. even thinking about that is kind of a nightmare. <laughs> yes, yeah, fair enough. But uh, yeah, the uh, what I was going to ask was uh, with the like 
uh, with having uh, you had Rolly doing the doing the narrations and Rob doing lead vocals and all being characters and stuff. Uh, I was gonna ask like live did uh, like was it more like the typical power metal band thing where it's like hey this song's about blah 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 or was it more oh in the mist before time blah <laughs> you know we, like <laughs> turn the turn the whole stage show into like a sort of it's, it's stage a, play type thing yeah it's a good question because it's it's funny like just recently like uh I'd say probably earlier this year we had we had quite a few shows. Well, I say quite a few because we had like four or five this year, and we you know that's us not playing at all for like almost six years. <laughs> so it's it's a uh, um, it's picking up pace a little bit. But we had a lot of discussions with the band um, between shows, saying like you know how do we want to handle like the banter, like stage banter and stuff like that, because we had the same thought process do we, do we want to be kind of relaxed you know wearing these costumes and stuff but do we want to be relaxed and just say hey you know make make crack jokes and stuff like that or do we want to be super serious and stay in character so we kind of like we we kind of approach it like a little bit of both because mm-hmm. um like like well, rob will do a lot of banter as the as jared fawn and kind of say i was, I was, I was going to say that is the advantage of the uh the characters you've got because you can play a bit uh, with it being yeah. like the high fantasy stuff you do you can play a bit of both ways yeah, yeah, and it, it works pretty well. Like, I mean, it seems like people get pretty entertained because we can, you know, almost like it's almost like a mocking parody where it's like, oh, this song is about the half dragon, you know, doing this, and it, and it doesn't seem weird because I mean, it's it's what the band is, so it's just kind of a natural approach to it, and it's been working pretty well. So, um, we had this huge orchestrated intro though with like a voiceover that that um that Rob had done when we were recording the album. It's not on the album, but and we use it live and it's him. Like it's all these tavern noises and, and, and Rob's talking his character, you know, he's like other own travelers. Like he's talking in a tavern, telling a story and he'll do a little intro and this huge orchestration starts. Oh, and then, nice. Uh, and then, uh, and then we'll kick into evil corruption usually. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Uh, I, oh, um, well, they, uh, as well as uh, your new album, you need to work on a live DVD. I really want to see that. <laughs> yeah, we, that sounds we awesome. Enough, we have quite enough footage for it. We have we filmed every show we played lately. Just the problem is right now we just have a stationary cam, so we'd actually need to have some some cameras to move around and, and have some more interesting shots because it'd probably be boring to watch just a fixed camera of, of one show. So yeah, yeah, fair point. No, uh, well, moving on to other things. Uh, one of the other reasons that I asked uh, asked you on here was uh, the the new album that you guys are working on. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so uh, what's the title of that one again? Two Shades uh, of Night. Yeah, Two Shades of Night. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So how is that coming along so far? It's um it. it... It's going along pretty well. We had to slow down a little bit because we were mainly gung ho about it last year and mm-hmm. around the time the, kick- the Kickstarter was for the book uh, because we wanted to have it ready for the release this year. But then um, lots of things have been happening. Like uh, we started playing some shows, trying to get some more live presence. Um, our guitar player Chris Cruz is actually uh, developing an arcade game. Um, ah, it's actually okay. an old school arcade cabinet called Sky Cursor, and it's doing pretty well right now. It's um, it's getting received uh, very well. Um, he actually got some um, some big big contacts from that, so it's like actually been a lot of his attention has been to, uh, kind of devoted to that. And if you think that'd make us kind of annoyed, but at the same time, like for example, Adam and I we're both game designers, like board game designers, mm-hmm. and um, we have a, a big project coming out this year from Fantasy Flight Games. Um, where we used to work, and uh, we're also developing another game with another company. So we're, we've been pretty busy, pretty busy with that side of things. So um, it's it's kind of frustrating because um, I really want to get the album. I want to kind of focus on the album, get that done. But we we all have so many different projects. We try to keep ourselves because I mean we could we could focus on the album and maybe get burnt out on it, you know, and make it a, a inferior product. Mm. Or we could take this time and focus on other projects to kind of keep ourselves refreshed. And that way, when we re- we reapproach the actual studio part of the uh, the recording of it, it'd be like a fresh, you know, exciting adventure. Um, so I'd say right now where we're at, we have about half the al- half the album pretty much solidly written. Um, the other half is pretty like pretty much done musically. We just got to you know put the final touches on it, and put the vocals on, it, everything like that. But um, I'd say realistically, we could be in the studio probably this summer to, to do the actual recording. And um, cool. if that if that works out, I, I could definitely see in a, a release this year at some point, maybe toward the end of the year. But we yeah. have like we have album art ready. We have uh, we have a lot of the other stuff, the promotional stuff ready, and we're we're very much toying with the idea of doing a Kickstarter for the next album. Oh, and, perfect. And 
we would probably launch that uh, earlier than when we were in the studio. That way we could like kind of build some more uh, hype for it and get some more attention on it. And that kind of, you know, motivate us a little more because that, that, that does wonders for me, like motivation from, from the outside. Because like when I was working on Eve, it was really hard to finish because I mean, as anybody will probably tell you, writing a novel is like pretty, pretty much just a practice and patience and determination and everything. So it's like really hard to stay like super focused, you know, but, um, mm-hmm. the more, the more, uh, excitement built around that, especially from outside is really, uh, really keeps me motivated and everything like that. So, um, so I, I kind of want to get a Kickstarter for that going. So we have, uh, so we have the asset, we got my, you know, tease the artwork and put some song samples up and stuff like that. Cool. And I can get busy back on the, uh, on the actual writing of the novel too. Cause that's something I need to focus on also. <laughs> mm. well, I'm not. Yeah. But like the amount of, the amount of stuff you guys do, uh, it within the whole Lauren guard thing, as well as outside of it sounds like, um, like you, how much stuff have you actually got planned for Lauren? Because I know it's it's the albums and the books, but have you got uh, you've got other splinter things coming off? Like like that um, you mentioning Rob doing a graphic novel. That's the first I've heard mention of that. Uh, yeah, the uh, that's kind of kept in the um um it's kind of a well, I, we had yeah okay so like <laughs> trying to think of the best way to word it because we have all these projects in this like uh, in this um container like we we just keep it we keep all these ideas to the side and, and don't have a lot of stuff we don't bring a lot of visibility to them but um i mean for, i can i can tease some things like adam and i being board game designers we've always wanted a lauren guard board game we actually have a publisher lined up who would be willing to do it with us but it's cool. a matter of us you know aligning that and ha- having the right idea and everything like that because we're actually finishing up a, a design right now and after we finish that one we could potentially start focusing on the Lauren Guard one and, and get that done, and that could be something we could finish, you know, at the end of the year with, and that also be a Kickstarter too, probably. Cool. Um, yeah, there's that. There's stuff like um, um, I I want to I want to do a uh, a digital game of some some kind, and like Chris is like the natural guy to partner with because Chris is a huge pixel guy. He's doing that arcade game, and I would love to have like an old school like side scroller Lauren Guard beat 'em up game, you know, or kind of <laughs> like the old D and D arcade games. Oh but, yeah, uh, yeah. There's there's a lot of potential for that, and it's like it's it's just a matter of of the right resources and the right and the right people behind it because it's all, all it really takes. We have like the talent and the 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 drive behind the band. It's just a matter of having the right resources available and the right um, and the time. Yeah, and the time. Yeah, it's like that. That's another kicker too, is because I, I kind of fall into that trap of. Um, of being like a jack of all trades, but like a master of none. So I'm trying to do all these different things, but like it takes away from like, for example, designing board games is fun, but it takes away from me like actually writing a book and becoming a better author or becoming yeah. a better drummer, you know? So it's like, it's fun to, to, to stay involved in all these different projects, but it's also kind of a curse because it, it's, you're kind of just, it's not really half-assing everything, but like you probably, you know, you could do better on something if you would just focus on one of these projects, but I try to do all these different ones and I, I don't think I'd change it because I like to, I like to have some diversity but at the same time it's like i know that i'm not putting out like a masterpiece because i you know i want to do 12 things at once so <laughs> that's that's kind of how my thought was on eve of corruption like as a writer like i was really hesitant to actually put the final stamp of like i'm done with this book and then put it to the printer but i knew if i didn't i would just spend another 10 years mulling over you know all these different yeah. parts it's like you know sometimes you just got to say hey this is done you know yeah i yeah, know uh, i've seen uh, like this that's probably um, a battle that every author goes through by the look of it. Because <laughs> yeah, I've, I've yeah. seen so many authors say the same thing. And it's like, um, I don't know, it's just knowing when when to just take a step back from it and go, oh, okay, I should probably leave this alone now, otherwise I'm going to tweak it to eternity. you will end up being George Lucas. Yeah, it's like once you start... For the old joke. Kinda... <laughs> yeah. yeah, but... Um, Speaking of, uh, uh, well, I was going to say, speaking of George Lucas, that's got nothing in, r- in relation to what I was going to say at all. Uh, speaking of uh, the book again, and going back to the character, I told you I was going to jump about a bit. Uh, <laughs> the uh, characters in there, uh, how many of the characters in that book are actually based on people that were involved in, in real life? Or is it mainly just the, the main heroes and Donovan? That's actually an interesting, interesting question because um, 
there there have been like nuggets of inspiration for people. Like for example, um, uh, this is, there's this character Xavier, who's um, one of the students at the Silver Spire. It's one of uh, one of Aneris' buddies. Um, she's kind of she's not really like a like a a huge character, but she plays an important role in a lot of ways, but that character, it's like, she's not necessarily based on somebody, but, um, there was, uh, one of our, one of my friends, um, from the early days of Lauren Guard, her name was, uh, Sarah, and she was actually a big supporter of the band. She would, like, drive out from Pennsylvania to see shows in, like, little small gymnasiums and stuff. It was insane. She was just really all about the band, and that was really important to me. And her favorite, like, name, like, online, she would always go by the handle of Xavier. So I always told her, like, yeah, I'll totally make you a character in the book, just because, like, I, you know, that name fits in the fantasy world pretty easily. So, mm. like, there's an example of somebody I just, and, like, I was, I was working in a fast food joint during college as a manager, and, uh, one of the girls there would always joke about my book like she thought it was like really nerdy you know I was writing a book and like I would always just kind of play along and then act like a total dweeb but like she would uh, her name was Laurel fire the spoiler cannon and I was like, I'm gonna make you a character in the book, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna like, kill you off or something. And I did. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a character named Laurel, and again, she's like a super important character, but it's kind of like one of those things that it's one of the, um, the, the like those two characters are both involved sort of yeah. in trigger events. Yeah, yeah, they're kind of just like trigger characters, and and there's a lot of those little things like that in not all the characters, but like a lot of characters like with naming and stuff. Like I, I throw in these nuggets, uh, these heavy metal nuggets in the book too. Like for example. Example, Whirl Sane, the witch hunter. His name after <laughs> World Dane, the singer for Nevermore. <laughs> yeah. I, I was, don't know I why. Was looking at, I was looking at that and thinking, why does this name sound familiar? <laughs> I don't know why I chose to do that. And then, like, of course, the god. Uh, the, I'm going to start god keeping of, an eye out for those now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> One of my favorites is the the god of justice um, from the sacred the sacred four gods. Um, the the god of the hammer. His name is Joachim. Was the singer of uh, Hammerfall. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there's those little like little gems in there that um and also one other one I should probably mention is is um when Adam and I uh, were first starting Lauren Guard we lived with these other twins like yeah we were a set of twins living with another t- set of twins and their last name was Lucas so there's actually a character named Lucas uh, Kane in the book who's a evil paladin but that name was kind of just an homage to living with these twins for so many years and oh, okay so yeah just um Naming, naming like that, so I, that's a, another, you asked a question really about pulling names, that's another way I pull names, is I just look at, you know, at my, my real life and just think of names I can kind of pay, pay tribute to. Nice. Like, um, is that, is that with, um, the paying tribute to influences and stuff, like, uh, is, uh, it sort of, re- uh, I'm trying to find the correct words to say. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just... That's okay. Yeah, no. Um, is, is it purely sticking just to names, or is, like, uh, uh, parts of, like, stories from, like, say, uh, say Rhapsody albums and stuff, like, influenced you? Like, uh, like it's like, um, kind of like how Smog in... The Hobbit has basically influenced every single dragon that has ever appeared afterwards. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, like there, there are some like I guess you can call them tropes that I, I try yeah. to I try to uh, um, embrace as, as as opposed to avoid. Like I don't I don't I don't care about um, repeating things because like in my mind like there's a lot of people who are really concerned with being original and originality, and I've never been one to concern myself with that too much because, I mean, originality is important and to be unique in your own way, but mm-hmm. I see no no problem telling a story that's been told before in my own voice, you know? So um, that's my, my way of being original. So I do play with tropes a lot. Like, for example, like, I mean, I made a conscious choice to make a dragon in the story, even though dragons are, like, the, the most cliche fantasy element there is, and I think that's a good thing because it's like this kind of says, hey, this, this is a fantasy story, man. We're embracing a lot of fantasy elements, so I wanted a dragon in there. Of course, our our take on the dragon is a lot different because it's very disgusting and sexual in a lot of ways, and I, I thought that was kind of a, a, a nice way to do it because it just I like to make it where uh, and the dragon's a bit mental. Yeah, very, very, <laughs> very. It's like you can't. That's that the one thing I wanted to make uh, clear is like we we just can't like as humans we can't really associate or understand what this what this guy is thinking because he's just he's literally a different. A different cre- different species, you know, it's just this yeah, crazy yeah. like serial killer type person who thinks he's doing honor to the world by killing people. It just it makes no sense to us. So um, I like that approach, and I just I get fascinated by that whole thing of not uh, not being able to understand or empathize with with these beings because they're just so. 
different than us. And yeah. it's it's something I told with too because like um with with a Drathian, for example, and, and even corruption, I'm really fascinated with that character because um He's kind of androgynous, androgynous. He's he can make, assume human form. He's like this beautiful man. He can just easily be a woman, you know. And this is who Anathu has to call his father. So it's like that's going to be really explored in book two. And I, and I look forward to doing that because I'm always fascinated by how disgustingly sexual okay. that, that dragon is. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> but um, speaking of storylines, that's that's one thing uh, basically like uh, in the book so far. Uh, spoilers for anyone. Fire the spoiler cannon! Uh, <laughs> skip, skip over this bit if you don't want spoilers. Um, uh, it ends with the uh, with the six of the Long Guard being together, and you leaving uh, leaving uh, <laughs> Anarith sort of stuck to a stake, going, "Why can't I burn?" <laughs> so what's like? Are they going back for him, or is he just going to figure out his powers himself? <laughs> they, that's that's actually um, another one of my favorite little storylines because uh, that was kind of a last minute thing for me in the book because I didn't I didn't know what to do with this guy I was I had a, like a, a black history written out for him like really dark past that no one really knew and I wanted to explore that um, but one thing that um, I kind of want to release eventually is a short story I wrote called um, the Son of Chaos and it's actually a story about um, the character they always mention in the story Skull. Oh, yeah. So, like, um, I think a lot of Anerith's, um, uh past is probably best understood through that short story. So, I kind of want to f- kind of find that, clean it up, and release that somehow, maybe like as a as a just a PDF or something online. Um, because I'm glad you I'm glad you were kind of intrigued by that because that's like actually something I'm probably most proud of is that storyline that that's going to evolve in book two with him. So, I, I won't I won't spoil too much about what what that leads to. Yeah. But actually, um, I actually just wrote a chapter. Like the, I think it's the second or third chapter in the next book is kind of picking up where we left off with Anerith, and it's it's pretty it's pretty fucking crazy. <laughs> nice. It gets really yeah. Weird. No. <laughs> I um, that was ba- oh, basically I got to the end of the book. I'm like, no, you can't leave him there. <laughs> Spoiler cannon. Yeah, like all, the, all the rest of them are in the forest, going off to <laughs> again spoilers. Uh, but then uh, and then. And it's just stuck being beaten up by by the the singer of Nevermore apparently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, I'm not going to get that rough. metal image out of my head now. <laughs> well, that's that's who I had in my mind when I was actually writing, like the visualization of this guy. Like, no, right. uh, I forget how I described him exactly in the in the book, but he's he's not really described too in depth. But I always thought of him as this, you know, just super long haired. Like, and I always imagined the. Uh, World Day, the the singer World Day, and being kind of like noble looking, just I don't know, he had this weird presence about him. But um, that's that's kind of how my mind works when I'm writing. I just have to think of some sort of like real life ins- inspiration for this character, and that's who it was for him. Not that I think that guy's a dick or anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, no, I'm I I really want to see where all these characters are going because. It's that's just, good to hear. It's yeah, so yeah. Encouraging. Because <laughs> I, I have trouble sometimes motivating myself to write. And I'm just like, who's reading this shit? You know, it's like, what am I writing this for? And, and like, am I writing this for, just for myself? Because I don't really need to read another book right now. But it's good to hear that, like, it's, it's some people are kind of evaluating it and getting into the characters because that helps me to, to kind of dedicate myself to keep yeah. writing it, you know? It's like, it's like, um, the, the characters that appear in the, uh, in the prologue haven't even turned up in the story yet, I don't think. Or oh, they yeah. have, and I haven't realized. The uh, the the prologue of Eve or the yeah the prologue the, of Eve yeah there's um they they return the the two the two that opens up on um, um Matthias and uh, and Raya they both actually appear in the epilogue very briefly they're kind of just you know random cultists the Scarlet's talking to you, and Scarlet's actually in the prologue too they kind of I kind of want to have that full circle where they all they kind of revisit each other in different roles mm. because in the prologue which is not really a spoiler you have Scarlet and Donovan creeping into this place and Raya and Matthias are kind of talking at the cultists and then at the epilogue we have spoiler cannon Scarlet well, actually yeah, it's kind of a spoiler but spoiler alert we have Scarlet who's kind of a cultist now hanging out with these two that he was sneaking past before, so he's kind of like part of their, their tribe now. So it's kind of a revisiting. And that's kind of the only reason those characters existed at the point, because I just wanted them to be the, the anchor from the prologue to the epilogue. Oh, okay, okay, fair enough. Yeah, no, because um, there was the, the one of them that... Uh, uh, which character... Oh, God. Uh, 
like my my um my memory's getting a bit like there's a jagged. lot of fucking yeah. books. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's the um, the bit where uh, they had the the uh, the guy who uh, Donovan mentioned um uh later in the book where uh, it was the the guy on the the. Uh, we, we, this is, like I'm just going to put a spoil warning at the beginning of this <laughs> podcast. Fuck it. Uh, um, where they're they're on the ship, and it, well, he was talking about his life previously on uh, on the ship with his parents, and there was that that guy who was who sold oh, sold yeah, relics yeah. to relics yeah. to the Silver Spire and yeah. got yeah, and um, he because he was earlier on in the book, and the guy like turns to, goes to kill him or whatever. Yeah, there was. Yeah, Einrist was the scribe in the prologue, and and in the flashback, um, it kind of explores his past with Donovan, how he was the one kind of responsible for getting his parents, getting Donovan's parents killed, and uh, and the prologue's kind of Donovan's like little revenge, which um, you know, he just gets his his main purpose is to get that that um, transcript, that transcribed scroll, but then he just kills which Einrist, lead, which yeah. leads to the events of Upon the Burning Isles. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Uh, fair enough. Yeah, no. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I want to read more of it. <laughs> <laughs> that's good to hear. I'll, I'll keep writing because uh, that's I, I take breaks a lot with with the writing process because um, I I can usually write pretty fast when I have the drive and mm. um, I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty dedicated to getting things done before revising them. So I'm actually like five chapters into the to the next well five solid chapters into the second book and I, I wrote those pretty quickly so I cool. suppose um, once we start picking up pace on the album again I'll be churning through that in no time nice it's like um, uh, like jumping to uh, other subjects again um, with you mentioning you've already got the artwork for the book sorted out and stuff uh, and well which will obviously be the cover for the next album too Mm-hmm. It's like um, I'm guessing your connections in like the gaming industry and stuff like that makes it a lot easier to find uh, people to do art and like just to generally get this so, to put some of these pieces together. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that like my brother um, Adam, he's uh, he was the one that did a lot of art when we were we were at Fantasy Flight Games for a few years, and um, I was more on the creative development side and the marketing side, and he was on the um, kind of the production side, and he would oversee a lot of projects. I mean, besides the f- he designed one of the biggest board games of the you know, last few years, Descent Second Edition. He was like the head guy behind that, so Ooh. he did get his hands in, involved in the creative process, but he really shined when it came to like. Like managing the the art, you know, and getting new art in and art descriptions, stuff like that. So he was kind of responsible for finding the right people for the art, and um, I would just kind of write. To, I would write the art descriptions and get those together. And uh, but yeah, luckily we had a lot of connections. We had a lot of places to go with for that, and and um, we still have a lot of connections with FFG, which is nice because we still work for them too on, on a freelance basis. Ah, fair enough. Um, yeah. Like with the with the art, then you had very specific ideas of what it was supposed to look. Oh, like. Oh yeah, yeah. We, like uh, I actually three had, pages of notes saying. <laughs> yeah, I actually this. scale it back because I know art artists like a little bit of freedom when they're doing their stuff. But like I have, I had so many ideas for the for the Eve of Corruption cover. Um, I had to go through. I had like four different iterations of it too. But the one we settled on was actually the one. Um, the artist uh, Julie Dillon, she actually had some input on that too. And she did a great job of implementing Soul Seratus in the sky and, and having um, – she, she kind of took what I described Cinder as and made him better than I thought I could describe him. So um, I was pretty happy with what she did. I love the color scheme yeah. and everything. So, But, yeah, we, uh, I actually give – I give people way too many notes. I, I mean, you can tell from this interview I ramble a lot, especially when it comes <laughs> to story stuff. I'll just go off the, off the rails. But um, I have, like, this email from when I sent to Julie, and I gave her, like, the backstory of every character that's in the scene and stuff. And I'm just like, what? She doesn't even know this shit. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, it, it, if it if it helps, then it helps. <laughs> That's the way I always figure it. Yeah. Like, just have as much information as possible, and then you can pick and choose. Yeah. But that was that was one thing I did like the fact that uh, the album cover is basically taken from the epilogue of the book. Yeah, yeah, that's that's. Uh... 
that's something I was kind of hesitant to do because I, I was always afraid that like that image might convey the wrong idea. Because like one of the things I'd like to take pride in is like Born Guard. It can be dark, but it's a little less dark than a lot of metal out there. Like I don't know if you have this problem in in Europe, but like in um in America, if I say I'm in a metal band, people just think I'm in like this hardcore emo, you know, metalcore band that just screams a lot. And it's like I hate. Oh uh, like, no, that's exactly the same here. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah no, a, it's it's <laughs> no, it's a worldwide thing. I think. Okay, that's a bummer. Yeah, because there's like this weird like fear of metal, and it just bugs me because I, like I said before, when you know, when I got into metal, that's the one thing that bugged me is I, I wasn't angry. Like I, I I do like a lot of thrash metal stuff like that. But I just don't need to like make it myself because I don't I don't come from that place. I don't think I don't have like all this, you know pent-up rage I need to get out, but oh. um, that's what everyone thinks when you say, I'm in a metal band, so when I see that cover, like, I'm always hesitant for people to see that as the first thing they see of the band, because it is, it looks pretty dark, it could easily be like a, a darker metal band cover, but like, I, I like it so much personally that I kind of don't care anymore, <laughs> you know? Yeah, like, no, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, no um, that's why normally when people ask me, like, uh, personally, when they're like, oh, what sort of music do you, do you, uh, uh, do you play? I end up launching into a ten-minute explanation. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's the easiest way to get it across because it's like, like um, with uh, my band being like a black metal band, basically all I get is, oh, so you sing about Satan? No, I do not sing about Satan. <laughs> That'd be very boring. <laughs> yeah, but it's like, um, it's like I can. Uh, well, the the way we were, like you were saying with this with this interview, I can imagine if someone asks you what sort of Metal, they're like, oh, uh, what do you play? Like, well, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 the. Although to be to be fair with Lauren Guard at this point, uh, you'd it'd be easy to just say, just take this and give them a copy of the book. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I got like eight hundred copies sitting around. So <laughs> really, <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, we need like a thousand print run for that um, Kickstarter. So I'm trying to get it set up on a web store right now, so we can actually sell them online. Because if you nice. go to buy the Eve of Corruption book online, you're probably going to be buying the print on demand edition, which is is the same thing. I did some editing for this this newer version, but mm-hmm. the newer version is a preferable size to me. I'll let you know, you have a little soft cover, you know. Yeah, yeah. Backs. I love those sizes. So I'm trying to get those available online so it's more widely available. But right now they're sitting in a, my guest room <laughs> in the big huge uh, stack of boxes. <laughs> How do you like uh, sell them? Sell them at gigs and yeah, them. yeah. It's mainly right now we use them for for merch at shows. We we sell quite a bit. Like like my band was surprised when um, we played back in 2010, I think, or 2012. We played this Atlanta festival, and um, I brought a few copies of my POD book, the Print on Demand book, and it was I think 20 copies. And like we had a shitload of our albums, but we just sold out of the books like within the first couple songs. And we're like, man, we got to print some more books, guys. <laughs> nice. It's such like a it's such yeah. like a pardon the pun, but such a novelty product because people aren't used to seeing books at you know a band yeah. show. So it's kind that's, of a, oh, this. that's one thing that you should uh, look into for the next uh, Kickstarter, by the way, which um, is uh, one thing I was hoping would uh, happen with uh, Eve of Corruption, that, um, like in the future. Was uh, have you ever seen those where you can get the the book? Like a, it's a hardcover book with a CD inside. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that was that was my um, that's my overall goal. To I mean, this is like long term, but like, I would love to have that as like the, the trilogy box set. Is like this, oh, this man, hardcover that would be amazing. trilogy box set with each box has or each book has the CD in the sleeve, and that's like oh, my yeah. uh, my like. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Save, save, save it for that. Save it for that. That'll be fucking amazing. <laughs> yeah, if I ever get to that point where I can release that, I can be like, all right, I can, I can stop I'm doing done. anything now. <laughs> yeah, I'm done, yeah. guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no oh god that would be amazing yeah. now um that's um uh, another thing i liked about the way you were writing you actually included in the back like a list of the characters and little descriptions of them and stuff as well which was kind of cool yeah yeah actually um that was something I wanted to do from the start because it's it's one of the reoccurring things I hear and people read the book and I mean I'm always open to criticism and um and like you know feedback but it's it's funny because people seem apprehensive to give it but uh, people who do give it back to me people I know who read the book like oh I couldn't keep track of the characters and I'm like well I mean I'm gonna have a, a big list of them in the back you know when the book's done so I'd always been working toward that but um it's it's surprising because um I don't know I, I'm more I I 
I was like a really heavy reader back in college. I read like about anything. I don't read as much anymore. I try to once in a while, but I usually just reread stuff I've already read, just kind of revisit it, yeah, like yeah. Um, you know, Lord of the Rings or something. But um, oh, but it's Lord funny because people awesome. seem. Yeah, yeah. People yeah. uh seem really apprehensive to dig into this book, people that I know, and I'm I'm just I'm curious to see whether or not it's because it is too, you know, scattered with like all these characters or okay. it's just too much to approach. I don't know. Some people just are afraid to approach it for some reason and I'm not I, really sure what what causes that. <laughs> yeah. I think it's um it's all to do with like different people read in different ways. It's like yeah. um, going back to us talking about uh, the Game of Thrones books. I had loads of people say to me uh, that they tried on the books and then ended up just watching the TV show version instead purely because with the books uh, swap each chapter swapping between different characters they couldn't really get themselves yeah. attached whereas yeah. I've read it and found myself just like enthralled with it and like I don't get why they were complaining yeah see that, so, that, must, be, that must be why like uh, it's like for example like when I read Game of Thrones that was like the book that changed how I wrote so that probably had a lot to do with how I had all these characters kind of just all these different storylines you know sparsed out because yeah. I, I just loved that it felt like a really like TV show approach of writing for a book yeah, so which it's, is it's like mean, <laughs> like, like reading through it and then going meanwhile over here this is how yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah it makes it 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 makes sense. Yeah, it's just kind of. I guess it's kind of my. I, I haven't like grasped that that mastery of that like Martin has, but like that's kind of the approach I was taking. I think early on because, like I said, I had the book pretty much halfway done um, for one of the drafts I had in college. But then I read Game of Thrones. And I just scrapped everything and started over. <laughs> I'm like, oh, this is how you write fantasy. <laughs> yeah, no, it's like because um, most most uh, uh, like. Uh, most uh, fantasy novels that uh, I've read, other than Game of Thrones and uh, the, uh, Eve of Corruption, is um, it's based on like a a small uh, like a a small a handful of people, and it's usually just like they're all together the majority of the time, so it's easier to follow. Like yeah. maybe one of them will splinter off or something, or like uh, say. The Hobbit, where it's like a few groups, maybe like there's group one, group two, and group three. Whereas, um, like with Game of Thrones and, and uh, Eve of Corruption, you've got like you started off with all your characters in various different points and sort of spider web them to the middle. Yeah, that's yeah, and it, it's like it's something I was really frustrated with because it, like the more I would get feedback about that, like we were just talking about the whole, the whole too many characters thing, it's like it, it's kind of rough starting off like that's my first novel doing that like a lot of people will start off writing a novel right like a standalone novel just straight ahead you know straightforward novel i decided to write like a complex novel as my first novel and it's like that that kind of it's kind of rough because i haven't mastered my voice and everything like that and i haven't really mastered the craft and the process of writing so yeah so it's i think it's 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 a it's a rough sell in a lot of ways, but, but I mean, I mean, hearing, hearing your take on it is kind of my preferred like take is like, that's kind of what I want to hear how people are reading it. They, they, they're intrigued by it. And even if they have complaints, I mean, I don't care as long as they actually enjoyed it and want to discover more of these characters. That's like the least I could ask for, you know? Yeah, yeah no, it's like, um, it's to me, I've always like, that's one draw to novels in the first place. And, uh, that was one thing that, uh, the eve of, eve of corruption uh if you don't mind me saying like got right it's uh <laughs> like uh compared to like um compared to some stories like you get you get into it and it's like oh yeah here's the characters let's watch them go from point a to point b it's like like uh the typical d and d books where all the characters right. meet up at the beginning and then go on yeah. an adventure together um like basically like i said the the hobbit storyline <laughs> Uh, the Hobbit track of doing things, whereas um, with this one, it's sort of like the origin story of where everyone came from and how they formed together, and then Skagrock knowing how everything's going down anyway. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because, <laughs> um, yeah, it was just... I don't know, I, I, found, I found it... Personally, I found it very... Like, it... Or, like, it was one of those where... Like, uh, one... One night at work, I had to do uh, I had to do um, an extra shift at work, and it was like uh, do um, just doing a sleep sleep in, and I'm like, um, so I'm having to sleep at work as an extra person just in case. Uh, I, I, and I took Eva Corruption with me, and I'm like, okay, I'll read a little bit and then get some sleep, and I ended up uh, awake reading until like four in the morning. <laughs> 
That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's just, I don't know. Um, and uh, to say that uh, this is your first novel, you did a massively good job. <laughs> I appreciate it, man. Yeah, I, really, yeah. I really do. It's like it's something I'm still self conscious about because uh, I know there's so many great books out there, so many great authors, and like everybody wants to write a book. It seems like so it's like I'm just an asshole with a book, but it's yeah, but it's the, one of those things um, where I don't have a lot of aspirations in that department as long as I can do it decently. So I mean, I, yeah, I find that really encouraging that you. That you that it, I mean, I, I feel bad that it kept you up that late, but at the same time, I feel <laughs> awesome because that's like I, I used to read Game of Thrones books, you know, like you know, I read Feast for Crows. I sat and read for like an entire day up until like two in the morning, and I'm like, I should probably put this down now. But like, that's that's just that's great stuff. I love hearing that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, no, no, it's like, um, but that's one of the cool the cool things about Lorengard is the fact that it's. Compared to like to quote to quote what you just said like uh, uh, every other asshole with a book, it's like <laughs> instead of it just being here's my book read this it's like oh well um, you can read it and you can listen to it at the same time and you can do this and sort yeah. of like oh, it's just um, like this massive interconnected universe and it's just re- really it's just I I've always loved this sort of stuff with uh, with um, like it's like when you buy uh, a band CD and you've got like the complete box set edition that comes with like a massive book of liner notes and stuff about about right. the uh, about the recording and all that sort of stuff. It's it's like having all these interconnected things. Just it, I don't know. It's just that's the way I prefer. Like if all media came like that, I would I would. I would probably be buying nothing but books and live on the street in a big house <laughs> made of books, but you know. No, I, I'm I'm actually the same way, obviously, because I mean that's that's what kind of got me started doing this, and and I, I was actually surprised early on when I started um, trying to like before we decided we want to do this all ourselves. I kept trying to find like you know labels or publishers who would latch onto something like this because I, I thought it'd be an easy sell. You know, it's like it's new, it's not really been done before. Yeah. So I figured like it'd be easy to get to get somebody, so maybe some new agent, some new book agent, like oh this sounds like something I can really cash in on, you know. And yeah. I don't, I, I'm fine if they can cash in on me all they want, but like I had so much trouble finding any interest at all and it just it got really it got frustrating enough where i just decided we should just do it ourselves you know we'll just crowdfund yeah, stuff. No, it's, it's 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 a lot easier to like nowadays to to get all of it done yourselves because um i know uh to name drop uh to name drop bands it's like um uh have you ever heard the the british band balsagoth oh yeah yeah definitely yeah yeah um that yeah those guys because uh i've been fortunate like Somehow, through random twist of fate, uh, my band's drummer knows those guys. And, oh, uh, cool. Yeah, so uh, so um, talking to them about what uh, uh, they've done, it's like they were like their vo- their old vo- vocalist, their vocalist Byron, who was planning all this sort of stuff. But he sort of like once they'd done the six albums, they couldn't really get any. Like even though they were signed to Nuclear Blast, it was. Like it was just the albums and all the sort of attached stuff didn't really sort of materialize compared to you guys have done like you've started out with a like you've started out as a better approach rather than just going oh well we'll start with the music and then maybe add things like you're just like no take it all right, all yeah, or nothing and that's yeah. that seems to be the best approach especially with the way you can like you said crowdfunding and all that sort of stuff you can basically just go. Uh, go around and say, "Hey, do you like this sort of stuff?" Well, I've got a book and a CD about it. Right, right. You know, yeah, that's something I hope we can continue on down the road because, like, I, as much as nice it would be to have a label to support us and, like, you know, allow us to go on tour and play places we couldn't normally play ourselves. Like that, that's like the only downside I think. Because other than that, like, the actual releasing things is, mm-hmm. like you said, it's totally viable just to crowdsource stuff and and we we can find funding for that kind of thing. But I just it, it's. The only thing missing, really, I think, is that support where it's like someone doing helping with the scheduling, helping with the promotional aspect. Because yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm very lazy with marketing. You, you'll you'll have trouble finding like any of my presence online because I just I just barely promote myself. I find it very uh, tedious to talk about myself, you know. So I don't do do it much. So I'm pretty bad at marketing my band, which is a shame because like I'm hurting the band in the process. But I just have so much trouble ramming my stuff down people's throats, you know. So it's yeah, yeah. it's uh, it's something I need to get better at because I know you have to keep marketing constantly this you know today with the social media and stuff because if people don't see you constantly doing things you kind of just forgotten about 
So um, it's 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 rough not having somebody there to help support in that regard. But yeah. at the same time, it does provide a lot more freedom and like a lot more ownership on our end of everything we do. So it's kind of a trade off. Yeah, fair fair enough. It's like, um, but yeah, I uh, to I'm trying to think of where where to go next. Um, <laughs> I've derailed us. <laughs> no, no, it's. Um, it's uh, it's probably me. This all, this always happens. We get 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 going on a tangent. I'm like, where was I again? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Now, um, like, you should listen to some of the normal podcasts with me and Mike. We we go horrible places. Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, back to back to uh, the subject at hand. Like with the uh, two shades of night. Uh, have you like uh, one thing? Uh, I've like uh, I needed to ask was um, like it all the all the songs are all, um, like it's are you doing it the same sort of way as you did with uh, with like we said with Eve, Eve of Corruption which is sort of going through and going right we'll do a song about this chapter and about this chapter and this chapter yeah, or is it sort of focusing more on specific characters and stuff like that kind of? It's it's kind of a mixed bag because um, I, f- I felt, oddly enough, as structured as Eve was, I felt it was kind of chaotic in the sense that mm. um, I kind of had – I we had a lot of back and forth of adapting the story to the album and then the album to the story. And I think the – I think with two shades, um, I have I had a better uh, sense of the bigger picture coming into it. So yeah. a lot of the earlier steps we took is I had a lot of just outlines of notes of what I thought this track listing should be and just and nuggets of ideas for the story. Like um, mm. uh, I'd have these mainly like, oddly enough, I had a lot of landscapes in mind. Like I would I would send Chris like this big detailed description of like this landscape of where this part of the story is taking place to just kind of set the mood of what the song should sound like. You know, so oh, that's yeah. kind of approach for me because I, I think like I'm getting a lot more visual with how I see the the landscape around because I'm we're exploring new places we're going to like the underworld and stuff and it's like the stuff that you it's going to be harder to convey because it's going to be like so like for like the underworld for example is like so different than any of the the you know real world quote unquote settings that it's that's why Lauren God starts making death metal songs <laughs> right yeah we start getting like super progressive and and off time and shit no, it's, it's gonna be uh we actually had an artist render what I thought the underworld looked like so we have like an actual artist rendition of it for like the book the album book of it it looks Ooh. pretty damn cool but um, it's actually another guy from the UK his name is Jamie Noble he was our artist this time and he's uh he's done a few pieces for us and it's it's looking pretty cool he's helping a lot nice. um, but yeah we still have to have him do some character pieces for the band too that that's art um but yeah for the for the actual writing of this um the story i i did have a lot of outlines and what i thought the how the book was going to go i had less actual writing because the with eve of corruption when by the time we were writing the the novel i had had like tons of iterations of the book already done but this time it's like i'm starting from fresh you know we're, we're starting the approach at ground zero with both the album and the book so um and actually, there's a chance – it's it's kind of um, up in the air, but there's a chance um, Adam, my brother, might be co-writing the book with me. Oh, second, okay. Because he's um, he's actually gotten into writing a little bit. He's um, He's got a lot of ideas about the story, which actually it's it's kind of interesting because in Eve of Corruption, a lot of the story ideas is stuff that we would, we would chat about because, we, like I said, we're always involved in the same projects. And, like, we were involved in a lot of the same D&D campaigns and stuff like that. So a lot of the story stuff is stuff that he's familiar with, too, and he would give ideas for. So we figured we'd give it a shot to see if we could just work together and get the book done. And I'm not – he's already done a, a chapter with it, but we're not sure. We haven't, like, discussed about how we're going to move forward with it. So we'll see oh, how that fair. goes. But, um, oh, so but it's, it's kind of a new approach to this whole this whole second phase of it fair enough so it'll be like kind of like you write a chapter and he writes a chapter and you write a chapter or is it going to be more of you both come up with the basic things and then sort of add to each other as work and stuff like that yeah the way we have it now is like i'll i'll work on the overall outline um i have this big long this huge document with all the different story pieces and and we'll just assign parts like you know I'll, like I'll, I'll do chapter one you do chapter two and and he does a lot he like he wants to be involved with a lot of sebastian stuff naturally so like yeah, yeah. i just assigned some of the sebastian chapters to him because they're too depressing for me to write so <laughs> <laughs> the but book two gets fucking dark it gets really shitty in book two so <laughs> it's that's how it's supposed to go because you know everything everything hits the bottom in book two and it's the empire strikes back of the trilogy <laughs> right yeah, yeah. 
So it's it's going to be fun to write because it's just going to tear all these characters down and drag them through the mud before they, they get back on their feet. Sounds pretty cool. Yeah. No, um, but, yeah, that's... Uh, I, 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 I want to listen to this album now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so do I, actually. I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting in the studio because I miss playing. Like, that's one of my favorite things about being in a band. Like, I... I love playing live and all, and like I feel like I'm a good showman, but um, I really thrive like in the studio environments. I love like recording, and I love just you know meticulizing each song, and and I don't know. I just I don't think meticulizing is actually a word, but meticulously. Yeah, I, I, I know. Uh, yeah, I, I know what you mean. <laughs> you don't like, get that. Uh, yeah, no, that that feeling like when you've been working on something for ages, and then when you like once you've recorded all the separate parts, you just press play in the recording studio and go, "Oh my god, that's brilliant!" Yeah, yeah. Uh, you just like as much as it's cheesy, like it's self, like it 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 can be really vain because you're like, "Oh my god, yeah. I'm a genius!" Yeah, exactly. But, yeah, yeah. but you're listening to it and like, how how did I come up? How was I a part of something so like yeah, yeah. awesome? I, 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 I had that uh, same exact feeling like when we were oddly enough in um in the Eve recordings, uh there was one song we actually we were out, actually only went to the studio with nine tracks. We only had nine songs for that album. But it, while we were in the studio, which the studio is Chris's house because he's a, he has all the studio equipment there, but um we actually wrote and recorded um Hands of Chaos, the the last song on that. Oh, yeah. And that's like people's like that's like a fan favorite. People love that song. We close every show with it. People just go nuts for it. And it's funny though because it's one of my favorite songs too, but listening to it, it's it's a lot different than other songs. But it's like I just can't believe we just wrote that on the spot in the studio because it's it came out like to me almost better than some of the other tracks that we spent years, you know, just pouring our, our hearts into and it just goes to show it's like sometimes spontaneity really pays off, you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's like the Hands of Chaos and Upon the Burning Isles are probably my two favorite tracks from the from the album. Oh man, I uh, I have a I have a vendetta against uh, Burning Isles, man. I, can't, I I I fucking hated recording that song so much because it was like the BPM was a little faster than we were like practicing it and writing it, you know. So uh, I, was, I was like, I was not catching the the verses. I was like, oh my god, why am I missing these? And like. And and uh, I, I love I love speed and everything, but like we're kind of moving away from a lot of the faster stuff and kind of more toward just the the bigger or- orchestral type things. But we went to play that song live a couple of years ago, and I was like so scared because I remember recording it and being miserable. But when we play live, I play to a click. I have like a in ear monitors with a click track, so we can have backing tracks in the PA. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so, like, I was so scared to play that live and, like, get off beat because it's a click track. But, like, we played it, and I just locked in, like, perfectly on that song every time. And I just still to this day I have no idea how because I had so much trouble in the studio with it playing to a click. But when we're playing it live, I just locked on so easily. So it's, it's like – It's the adrenaline. It must it's be, like, yeah, yeah. It must totally be. Um, speaking, like, uh, I've we've had that uh, – we, well, to be fair, we have the opposite problem with, with, uh, with our drummer in 40s because um, he used to play in, like, a – uh, he still plays in a like a technical death metal band, and he also yeah. used to do drums for like a, a full on death metal grindcore band. So yeah. the problem was when we wanted him to play slow, and he was like, <laughs> "I can't do it; it's not yeah. fast enough." No, I, I, yeah, it's just nothing but blast beats everywhere. No, like I had that when we first started doing Lauren Guard Live. Like I, I didn't play to a click early on. We just started the click thing recently. But like, because the only reason we do that is because when I was in that goth industrial band, they yeah. they had to play to a click because they had all that weird backing track going on. So like, right. I got really good at that. And like, the songs were so damn boring for me that I would like spin my sticks on every like every fucking downbeat. I would spin a stick. So like, I got really good at stick spinning. So now when we play that, like I had the problem where. Um, before we started playing to click again, I would be spinning sticks too much and playing too fast on every song because I didn't have a click to, to back me up. I'd oh, be yeah. speeding every song up. I'd be dropping sticks left and right. So, like, it was kind of messy live. So now that we play to a click again, and, like, it's just, it's it's a lot more solid, but I still have that freedom to, like, you know, I can just sit there and spin sticks every time I'm doing a downbeat because I just have that experience from playing boring songs live <laughs> for so long. <laughs> Fair enough. No, it's like, um, and also Upon the Burning Isles was one of the ones why I was going to ask you about um like uh, wanted to ask you if you knew about uh if you'd heard Balsagoth before because there's the one that that keyboard section with Raleigh doing the spoke oh, yeah. word I'm just like oh my I was just like this sounds so Balsagoth it's fantastic 
Yeah, I actually, um, I got exposed to Balsagoth really early on before I even got to like Rhapsody and stuff. Mm. And like the first time I'd heard it, like, like, um, I think, I think I was still listening to a lot of like death metal at the time. And, oh, yeah. uh, so, um, I didn't, I didn't have that aversion to like, to the, the chunkier vocals, you know, but, um, the, the thing that really caught me was the keyboards because I had not listened too much that had that heavy of keyboards in it. So like, when Oh I yeah. Heard, Johnny's a, Johnny is a fantastic keyboard. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I just loved how heavy it was in the mix and everything. And it just, um, it really set this mood, you know, like I, I didn't, I didn't dig too deep into them. I just never had their albums, but like everything I've heard, it has like this weird nostalgia to it. Cause it was like this time in my life when I was getting, getting into all this new music and stuff. And my buddy yeah. had, Couple of their albums. I forget what it was called though. The one that I heard a lot, but it had some really killer keyboard stuff going on in it. Uh, oh, I'm trying, trying to think of. Um, the, uh, it doesn't matter. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here to talk about your band, not my mates. <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, no. Um, uh, going off uh, like the trail into like this. In, uh, we're going more into the random question territory anyway. Uh, it's like. Um, with you saying that the book gets darker and stuff and me joking about the death metal thing, that was one thing, like, uh, I've always thought would be, uh, cool. Cause, you know, at one point, uh, Rhapsody became Rhapsody of Fire and then they broke up and then there was a Rhapsody and there was Rhapsody of Fire at the same time. Right. <laughs> yeah, um, it's like one of the things I was, what I was hoping from that was that it was all some sort of sales gimmick, and what they were going to do was do uh, another storyline thing, but where one band did the storyline from one side and one did the storyline from the other, because <laughs> yeah. that would have been amazing. <laughs> That'd be awesome, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was just, I was just wondering, like, um, if you were going, oh, I want to work on Lorengard, but I don't want to like work too much on the new, on the new the actual Lorengard stuff itself, would you consider doing that as a side project? Just be like, okay, I'm going to write some stuff just from the point of view of the bad guys. <laughs> yeah, that'd be, that'd be really cool. I, I always have ideas for, like, um, different projects to be involved in. And, like, before, uh, like, I got too heavily into Lorengard, I had this idea for Metal Opera, um, which kind of, I, I stole a lot of that stuff and brought it into Lorengard. But mm. um, I, I've always been fascinated by that aspect of, like, having, like, a Metal Opera where you have all these different characters Different singers singing different characters, you know, and like having some oh, like, definitely um, guys do the villains. Yeah, yeah. And like, you know, have, have, like have you uh, heard of the band Arion? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, that that sort, of, yeah, that sort of that sort of stuff. It, that's um, like uh, all like uh, Jeff Wayne's War of the Worlds. It's like that sort of stuff. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah actually, uh, I actually have um, I got quite heavily into um, Avantasia too. That Toby is uh, Toby is Sam, uh, how do you pronounce his name? The guy from Edgy yeah. Eye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was, uh, a lot of those metal operas he did, which weren't as, they weren't as dynamic and diverse as Arian, you know, but I guess what kind of got me into that whole idea of having this, like, full cast drama, you know, a metal album. And, yeah. but, but like you said, like having a, having like a, a side project doing the same, if I did a side project, I'd probably do it, I'd probably do something different than Lauren Guard because I'd, the whole thing is to get away from Lauren Guard and do something different because yeah. I have a lot of, I, I have a lot of story ideas for like, um, like post apocalyptic type of st- stories and, Ooh, cool. and, you know, like, um, that, that's one of the games I'm working on actually is this, uh, is this idea where, uh, it's kind of like a modern day, but with like a few advancements where it's like you, like a lot of the industrial, um, work is done with mechs, these like walkers, you know, and oh, like yeah. the military is uh, really, uh, really strict and there's like this war going on outside of the world and and these all these farmers who have these like broken down walkers decide to put like a bunch of uh weapons they found from these military bases onto them so like these like rebel guys these mechs and i have this huge story for this but i know it's like i can't really do that in lauren guard so it's like i might explore that more sometime but that's the kind of stuff i'd probably like work on outside of lauren guard yeah, but i yeah. wouldn't be opposed to being involved in something else that's that's similar to lauren guard but but with lauren guard taking up so much of my time it's like i'd probably want to get away from it if I was going to do something else. <laughs> yeah, fair, fair enough. Makes sense. I mean, um, and just out of curiosity as a musician, do you play, uh, do you only play drums or do you play other instruments as well? I've, I've tried to, uh, to learn other, like I've, I've dicked around on guitar, um, keyboards a little more than that. Um, I actually just started taking some singing lessons cause I've always been, um, of the opinion that I can't sing. But then after taking a few lessons, I was told that I actually had a decent voice and I just have to like, you know, breathe better when I'm singing. So I might start exploring that more, but like mainly, um, I, I, I've always felt that I was like 
not even a musician at all. Like I don't, I'm, I just hit things really hard and fast. I'm, I'm not really <laughs> melodic, but I'd like to be eventually. And I think someday, like if I'm teaching my kids, you know, music, I might have them play something I could probably learn to with them. That way I might be able to explore other stuff. Cause I, when I, before I started Lauren Guard, I was trying so hard to be like fucking Phil Collins of metal. I wanted to like play all the instruments myself and write songs because I couldn't find anybody to do it with. Yeah. So, yeah no. But my, my brother Adam's actually a really good guitar player. He plays guitar. He, he started on guitar before he started playing bass. So, um, he's got a leg up on that. Um, he just, I think he's, he's been less inclined to do things himself. Cause like, um, not that he's not as driven as I am, but he's yeah. always he always likes to be involved in group stuff. He likes to be like he likes to play off of the energy of others. And oh, I always okay. I've kind of been when I was starting off of Lauren Guard, I was kind of more introverted. I kind of want to do it all myself, and I had all these ideas burning up in my brain, so I wanted to get them out. So I had more of a drive to kind of learn all that shit myself, and mm. just never took. And by the time I was like starting to get serious about it, we found Chris, and I just forgot about it. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, no, and um, uh. To go uh, and more random questions. Uh, you were talking about you and your brother playing D and D. Uh huh. Mhm. Do you ha- uh, do you have any like favorite D and D tales that you could relate? Oh man. <laughs> well, okay. There's um. Uh, it wasn't necessarily D and D, but it was a role playing game. It was a Warhammer Fantasy role play. Um, oh I, yeah, I fucking yeah, love yeah. that game. <laughs> yeah, that, that was my first job in the games industry is writing for Warhammer Fantasy role play. So I was oh my god, that was amazing. And, yeah, I loved that. It, this, this was the third edition for FFG, the big box set with all the components. You know, um, oh, so oh, we I've were, always uh, loved. I've always loved the Warhammer Forty yeah. K. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, like yeah. half of the half of the the first Fornius demo, all the lyrics are basically just about Warhammer 40k and like the oh, fucking chaos ass. demons and shit. That's it's awesome. like, well, like the black metal, that, that EP is like the black metal version of fucking Bolt Thrower. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Adam and I have always been obsessed with, um, when we first got into gaming, we were obsessed with Warhammer, the fantasy, the old world. Like that oh, was yeah, our yeah. big thing, you know, so we've always been in a Warhammer quest and, uh, and this, uh, when we played Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, I think one of the most memorable stories we had was, um, uh, we were playing, I think I was, I think I was the GM and, uh, I was, I was leading these guys into this big, huge, um, Slanesh orgy, like this, uh, <laughs> this huge log cabin, you know, right, and yeah. some heroes, my brother was one of the heroes. And then we had our buddy, this guy, Tom, who was, um, who, who was kind of like, I mean, he, he's, he's at the same sense of humor as us, but we're a little darker, I think. Mm-hmm. And, um, I wasn't, I wasn't sure how he'd react to walking in on this, you know, Slanesh orgy when they go in there. So, like, they, they, they're walking in and they're not sure what they're getting into. And when they open the doors, they see this huge room covered in fecal matter and sex juice and, you know, all kinds of disgusting <laughs> stuff. And, like, nice. I ask them what they say. And Tom says his character steps up and takes his shirt off and says, where do you want us? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, dude, that is, you just won the game. <laughs> I was like, roll your, <laughs> roll your bluff check, dude. <laughs> so like, oh, like still to this day, it's one of my favorite like RPG moments I've ever had. <laughs> that is fucking great. Oh god, that's like um, I remember uh, the only full. Well, when I started playing, first time I ever played D and D in college, it was like uh, my mate James was running it and. It was a pretty bogged down game because it was like, as much as it's like a party should probably be about four or five people, uh, there was like ten of us because it was the <laughs> entire group of yeah, it was the entire group of friends, and uh, James sort of bring it just to uh, introduce us. So we basically set up a, a time rule thing, so it's like you only get a certain amount of time to say what your character does, uh, and then um, I was going through and like. Uh, we got to a bit where our characters come across this river and then it was uh the one of uh my mate Jason who was playing a dwarf goes, Okay, um uh we, we should probably look around. So the half half orc um of the party goes, I know and throws him up a tree <laughs> <laughs> So Jason stuck up this bloody tree. <laughs> and then one of the other members of the party goes, I know, I'll I'll try and jump across the river. Tries to jump across, falls in, starts getting swept away down the river. Um, like, uh, the Kirsten was playing a ranger. She goes, oh, I'll jump in and save him, and uh, jumps into the river. Uh, James's DM goes, okay, what's your swim skill? She goes, what swim skill? <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, God. 
<laughs> so she gets swept down the river as well. I jump in voluntarily because I figure it's leading somewhere. Everyone else ends up getting thrown in. And then Jason finally, until there's only Jason left, and uh, he finally gets down from the tree. He's like, I'm not getting in that river. So, and Jason's, and uh, James as DM's like, okay, um, because he's basically trying to get us into this cave. And he's like, okay, uh, I can't just leave you here by yourself. So a random ninja jumps out of a bush, kicks him into the river and leaves. <laughs> Divine intervention. <laughs> yeah, it was like one of, a, what, one of my, like, <laughs> it was just confusing. That and um, I started off as a human and uh, one of my main memories about that game was playing a human sorcerer that ended up being cursed to be shorter than the halfling. <laughs> it was bloody typical. But, yeah, no. Um, that's one thing I love about making um, games like that. And, uh, like, this sort of high fantasy thing anyway, you can just, you can get away with all sorts of this sort of weird, crazy yeah, hijinks yeah, that you can't, you can't in anything else. Yeah, there's always an excuse you can make make up, and it still seems to work, you know. Yeah. Like so <laughs> it makes for good stories. Mm, definitely. It's like um, one thing uh, um, I've been watching a, a guy on the internet called uh, Spoonie. He does um, he does uh, this thing called Counter Monkey, where he retells like D and D stories and stuff like. Oh yeah. <laughs> and uh, nice. Mm, and uh, I highly recommend that you should watch some of it. I'll link you to some later. And, cool, uh, yeah, I'll check it out. Yes. Yeah. And uh, one thing uh, uh, he was uh, the I'll 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 give you is um, he was talking about uh, a game um, where he used something called the Bardic Knock spell because he was he he always played a bard, uh-huh. right? And uh, he's so uh, he's playing with his his Pathfinder group and the coming up to something and the half of the they they come across this locked door for this guard tower that they need to get in and they're trying to to get in in there and um, the wizard like tries the spells to pick the lock it doesn't work the thief tries to pick the lock that doesn't work either they're like oh what can we do and Spoonie goes I've got an idea uh, I, I've got something for this. And they're like, oh, really, what's that? He's like, I call it the Bardic Knock spell. And they're like, oh, really, what, what's that? And he, so he walks up and knocks on the door. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the DM stares at him and it goes, makes sense. And then just goes, the guard opens the door. Because <laughs> he was like, well... If you're a guard, you're sat there, and then someone knocks at the door, you're going to be like, well, who's knocking? And open the door to find out. So It must be kind of ballsy. So, <laughs> so that was the whole point of his video. Is like, you need to, as a character, take risks, because it's because it adds to the entertainment of the game. Yeah, that's that's the one thing. Is like, I, I whenever I'm a player in an RPG, usually like if I'm playing with my wife or something, or like so, some of my friends that don't really get my style, play style, they get really pissed at me because I... I act kind of. I always play a halfling or a gnome. I was one of the short dudes, and like I always play an idiot, like some guy who just causes trouble, and not because he's like he's a dick, but just because he's just he's kind of just you know ditzy or something. Hmm. But like from a game standpoint, that's that's just where I know the best stories come from. Like if I do like like if we're trying to uh, cross a huge chasm and someone knock the bridge out, I'll just tie a rope to me and tell the dwarf to throw me as far as you can. <laughs> see what happens, you know. <laughs> and like it's not the smartest thing to do, but it's like someone might suggest that and that's a funny story. So let's see what happens, you know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, it's the RPGs because I just think it's that's that's where the GM gets to shine because he gets to make up all this weird shit that happens to someone who makes a stupid decision, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's like um like my brother telling me loads of stories of his games because he manages to he plays Pathfinder regularly, and him uh, saying about how he's he's a known paladin, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and um, like how uh, he uh, in the in his group there's loads of people who uh, are are um, like one of them is a thief. And the the whenever they do it, whenever he's sneaking about, like he's a, he's a rogue. Whenever he's sneaking about, stealing stuff, one of the other members of the party also always has to go around to my brother's character and distract him <laughs> <laughs> and stuff like that. They've just got, you you build this rapport with everyone, and it's just a it's just like the tales you tell are fantastic. It's like um, 
he was saying about what in the first game of that there was they were doing some I can't remember what it was. They ended up fighting something and one the arrows went uh went flying uh and like hit uh, uh in the battle uh like just one of them rolled such a bad miss when they were when they were trying to use a uh, use a bow against like I, I can't remember what they were fighting goblins something like that. The, the DM was saying, "Oh yeah, you've got a uh, you missed so badly." The arrow goes flying for miles and hits a tavern sign, <laughs> and then um, and then later at the end of the game, uh, they, they come into this uh, this um, this. They're like, "Oh, let, let's go to this inn and stop in this inn to uh, to." And we'll wrap up the game there. And the first thing my brother does was walk up to the bar and go, go, do you know you've got an arrow in your side? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I, I want to get more involved in, in shit like that, just because I, I, I'm mainly a sci-fi geek at the minute. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, there's, fan- some good, uh, there's some good sci-fi RPGs out there. The new Star Wars one is pretty fun. Like I, I was uh, at FFG when they were developing it, oh, yeah. and uh, since it came out, like we played it with my group, and it's it's a blast. It's a really cool system. But speaking of RPGs, it's funny because uh, the Lauren Guard guys actually, I actually ran them through Pathfinder. Um, we were actually playing the Rise of the Rune Lords uh, Adventure Path. Oh, okay. And, like, oh, that was there. That's what my brother's playing currently. Yeah, it's fun. It's it's actually that's the first time um, we like Adam and I had gotten. Chris and Dave to actually play, and then when Alec moved back from California, and then Rob moved here from Pennsylvania, we were all here together finally, and we got everybody together to play a couple sessions of uh, Pathfinder, and it was it's a it's a blast. Like it was just really funny because Alec had no experience with this at all. I mean, he's a big physics nerd, but he doesn't really play a lot of games, and we had him playing this dwarf bard. And it was really funny to see his interpretation of this, how this dwarf would act, because usually you see people do the cliche stuff when they're playing a lot of RPGs, but getting somebody fresh in there, it's really funny to see how they interpret situations and try to, and since he's a physics guy, he tries to think of all these, like, really smart ways to get out of things. I'm like, dude, you gotta be stupid. This is, <laughs> this is an RPG, man. Make it interesting. <laughs> you can't do everything right. <laughs> so that was pretty fun. Nice. It's like, um, my brother's currently trying to uh, set up a, uh, a Pathfinder campaign in the oh, what's it called the um the pirate one? Oh, Skull and Shackles, yeah. Yeah, Skull and Shackles. He's trying yeah. to set that up, and um, uh, I've ended up playing uh, a dwarf, and uh, it's like I was saying to him, oh, I kind of want to be a bard, so I can use the bardic not spell, <laughs> <laughs> or I want to be a fighter, and I don't know which one would make more sense. And then he's like, oh well. For Pathfinder, they've just released this thing called a this class called a Skald that's half barbarian and half uh, half bard. I'm like sold. <laughs> yeah. So now, so now my uh, I'm basically a short Viking. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, and we uh, it got to the point where me and uh, my brother's mate Tofa, we were talking about because um, he was like this uh, half. He was originally a half orc barbarian or something. And we ended up, like, before the game had even started, we'd already started, uh, we were, we've not even played a session yet, and we were already having our characters throwing insults at each other. <laughs> like, I started translating insults of uh, telling him to to, uh, to sleep with his own mother in, like, Old Norse and shit like that, <laughs> just because we thought it was hilarious. He's like, I have no idea what you're saying. I'm like, good. <laughs> And I actually, like, in the, like, it, it's, I don't know, it's just, um, that's one of the things that uh, adds to that. That's why uh, I wish I lived close to people I could I could play along with. Like, yeah. uh. I had a lot of good uh, good game groups in Minnesota when I was living up there working at FFG, and it, it kind of sucks uh, moving away. And, I mean, I have some, I have, like, a once-a-week game night here, but I used to play, like, three or four times a week back in Minnesota. Mm. But I need to start to get into, like, Skype uh, role-playing, because a lot of people use these different, uh, these different like, programs where you can run oh, yeah, campaigns like, uh, easily online. And... Roll 20 shit like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And they actually, this the thing I'm looking forward to the most, actually, is that Sword Coast Legends game coming out. It's like, it runs off the new uh, D&D 5th Edition rules, but it's a video okay. game 
where you actually – have you heard much about this at all? No, I haven't. It's, it's, it's like the, mo- the closest they've come, I think, to digital D&D because the way it works is like you'll have a – let's say you have a group of five guys playing this game. Four of them become heroes and one of them is the GM. So like as the GM, you're just you're, – you have an isometric view of the dungeon that guys are going through. And at, like in real time as they're going, you can just add stuff to – you can like trap doors. You can like add ambushed monsters. Oh, my God. Stuff. That sounds – that sounds amazing. Yeah, and it looks so easy to do because, like, you just have all these what's minis. This, what's this game called again? It's, it's called a Sword Coast Legends, and it's up for pre-order right now. It comes out pretty soon. My brother is, like, How do you spell up. that? Uh, just Sword, S-W-R-D, and then Coast is C-O-A-S-T. Oh, Sword Coast. Yeah, Sword Coast, yeah. Um, and it's it's based off of um, the Neverwinter stuff, or Baldur's Gate stuff, I think. Yeah, mm-hmm. Baldur's Gate, because I think at the end of the – I think it was Baldur's Gate. I forget. But it's – but it's – um. It's like the same type of games, like Neverwinter Nights, just updated. But like the the UI looks really streamlined, and the DM looks like really easy to run. You just have all these options, like you can choose what monsters to drop in, and like you kind of get these points, like as a point system, where like you have a certain amount of points to use against the heroes to keep things kind of balanced, you know. Mm. But it looks it looks super awesome. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just, pumped on that. Yeah, I'm just looking at it now, and it looks oh, that looks pretty awesome. Yeah, and I love the, they, um, use the, uh, they use the new edition rules, the fifth edition, which is so far I haven't played it yet, but I've read a lot about it. It looks really, really cool. Mm. I'm just looking at it and looking at the the price tag for like the campaign stuff. I'm like, oh god, damn it. <laughs> gonna be saving for a while. Yeah, <laughs> but oh, it should be a pretty sweet game. Yeah, that looks pretty yeah, nice. I'll have to actually make a computer that can fucking play it but yeah i think that'll be the uh the closest thing they'll have to like actually video game D D kind of merging because you can do those like skype sessions of role playing which is still fun but like having like really cool visuals like that where it's like real-time video game stuff it just seems like a perfect combination yeah yeah that'd be cool the the only thing i'd miss from that probably is like as like what you can do with the like the dm talking to the players if that yeah, makes sense. yeah, yeah. Well, I think I think um, I mean it's not the same thing, but like I think in this game you're like you can all be in like the same Skype and you can all chat while you're playing, you know, and like the DM kind of like laugh while he's doing stuff to you and shit mm-hmm. like that. But but you do lose a little bit of the narrative, I think. So I'm sure they don't have as much. They probably have some scripted narrative in the random dungeons they have in this game. Yeah, but yeah. like you're playing actual D and D, it's like the most of the fun comes from like you know the DM reasoning why these things yeah. are happening and stuff like that. So 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 this is more like a uh, like. For for when you decide you just want to do like a dungeon grind type type yeah uh, type the, of game the way the, yeah the way I see it the way it'd work really cool for like if I, if I was running a group I, I'd be a DM and I'd say like right, we're gonna play a campaign of D and D and you can make characters and stuff but you make characters in this game but when oh, yeah. you're doing like the the story stuff you can like go to town and talk and shit but then like when you say all right we're gonna go to, you're gonna go to this place and then that's when you start the game up and go into a random dungeon and then you just play through that dungeon so you kind of combine it with like your whole narrative but oh that's, yeah that's that could work that, I play you know that could work that w- that would be pretty cool. Yeah, I think it's a pretty cool tool to use. Yeah, yeah, that definitely, like, uh, it would, it would mean less. Uh, you wouldn't have to, especially with like a uh, roll twenty or or um, like Skype games and stuff. You wouldn't have to worry about like uh, people's dice rolls and all that. Yeah, stuff. exactly. I mean, it's yeah. already in there. Less tracking of all that information and stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's just basically like quick attack these things. Right. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that would be pretty fucking cool. But yeah, oh no, you. I need to get a gaming PC sorted now. Yeah, me too. I'm, yeah. I'm working on that myself. I have a, I have a commission. I need to finish up on this game I'm designing. And I think I'm gonna use that money to get a new computer because <laughs> mine's oh, nice. like, it works. But I just, I'd like to get it updated because I'm about to get GTA 5 on it. And I know it's gonna require quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of power to run that smoothly. So yeah. yeah. Uh, speaking of games, have you heard? Of, uh, like, did you ever watch the? Um, uh, like, did you ever play the Ultima games? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I, I played Ultima Online, which was um, which was probably the not the pinnacle of the series, but it was kind of like a. It, well, I didn't play the actual stories of the originals, like the old Ultima games, but the Ultima Online sucked a lot of my time when I was in high school. I I got into that over the summer one year, and I just could not stop playing. It was like the first you know, big know. MMO, you know. But that thing. Um, uh, it's funny too because when I played that, did you ever play Ultima Online at all? Uh, no, I didn't. Unfortunately, I've, it's, I. It's got a weird. Um, 
it's like, you know, isometric type game, very low graphics and stuff, but like, it had this weird charm to it where like, I, I barely even adventured. I would just sit in town. I would be a fucking chef or a baker and I would just go out and get some stuff from the farms and go back to the kitchen and make a pie. And I would do that for like fucking months. I would just, I don't know what it was. That game just had this weird like economy to it where I felt like I had to be like a, a tradesperson, you know, to contribute mm. to society. And then if I went out and actually fought something, I'd get slaughtered. <laughs> it's a very bizarre game, but I loved it. Yeah, no. Uh... Um, they've. <coughs> oh, sorry. Um, That's alright. <laughs> yeah, no. They, um, I was just asking because they've um, all this talk of new games. They've uh, they actually started working on a new one called Shroud of the Avatar, which. Oh, nice. Yeah, it, um, it that looks pretty fucking cool. I've I've pre-ordered that, even though I know I'll, my computer currently won't run it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's basically just to sort of. It'll probably work around um, the same way to... Uh, I got it purely to try and motivate myself into upgrading my computer finally. Yeah. Uh, but it'll probably work the same way as getting Dread on uh, on Blu-ray did. It was like, oh yeah, I'll totally get a Blu-ray player now that I've got Dread on Blu-ray. Never did. <laughs> so, so I've got a Blu-ray of Dread just sat around doing nothing. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, the, um, the, the game, because uh, it's made by... Uh, like the guys who made Ultima Online and Richard Garrett, who made the original Ultima games, is involved and stuff as well. And uh, they've like because uh, they want to keep it like make it look uh, look back on the old Ultima games and stuff. He's making like a physical uh, physical packages available where you get like a, a cloth map and a nice. and uh, and like a CD of the. So let me try and find the um, the thing, the website for it to try and find. I can't find it, but it's all like uh, you get um, like the the map and like a CD soundtrack and the the box of the books, and you get a um, an actual printed copy of um, this because they have loads of uh, stuff written in runes and stuff. You get a copy of the rune translations and stuff. Oh, cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, it's all stuff like that. And, uh... Yeah. Oops. But, um... Yeah, I've been meaning to get into back into gaming like that. Most of the gaming I've been playing at the minute is Minecraft. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, I hear that's addicting. I, I've only played a little bit of it, but I played Terraria, which is kind of like the side-scrolling version of Minecraft, and yeah. I got hooked in that for a while. It's pretty, It's pretty fun stuff. Yeah, no. Um, uh, the main reason I've been playing Minecraft is because my son loves it so bloody much. Although I've oh, only yeah. got it on, on, I've only got it on Xbox, and oh, okay. which is uh, a shame because I've watched a load of videos online, and I'm like, oh, I want all these mods where I can make uh, I can make railways to go to space and all of this. <laughs> right. Yeah. But how old's your son? Yeah, uh, he's he's six. Six, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to when my daughter starts getting more into games. She plays some board games with me, but I usually do all the work for her. She's only three right now, but ah, uh, okay. To, she loves watching me play. Like I play a lot of MOBAs, like um, League of Legends and Heroes of the Storm, and she always like is sitting on my lap. Can I help? I'm like, yeah, your version of helping is not helping my team though. So. Yeah. <laughs> so sooner or later she'll probably be getting pretty into that kind of stuff. Yeah. No. Uh, Connor was the, Connor was the same when he was. When uh, when he was younger, but um, more recently now, um, like more often than not, if we're not playing Minecraft, it's uh, uh, Sky the Skylanders games. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, was, I kind uh, of I kind of regret not having a kid in that age group because when those things came out, I was like, I want to buy these, but I feel like I'm wasting money if I buy them for myself. If I if I had a kid though, man, I'd buy all this shit. <laughs> Yeah, oh, it doesn't look like they're going to stop making those games anytime soon, dude. So yeah, just, yeah. just wait a couple of years, you'll yeah. be fine. But, um, I saw they're doing the uh, the Lego ones now. The Lego oh yeah, I've, I've, like I've seen <laughs> I've seen that. I was like, oh my god, I'm going to have to buy that. Even if, <laughs> like the only thing is, I want to know how far it'll go back because I've still got Lego from when when uh, I was like six. So oh, yeah. like so the first ones and stuff. <laughs> yeah, like uh, the the. The uh, space police and like yeah, uh, yeah. ice planet stuff, and yeah. it's like I want to stick that on there and see what happens. <laughs> uh, it's like because 
it's saying, oh yeah, you put it on this pad and then it'll scan it into the game. I'm like, well, how? How big is this? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just imagining like this massive box that you just stick Lego in because half the Lego sets are friggin' huge. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, so I'm not entirely sure how that's going to work. But yeah, no, that looks insane. Yeah, it's going to be pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah. It, weird. But, yeah, well, uh, we've got off. <laughs> off track of it. Uh, like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's fine. It's what this show's about. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I need to to ask you about before we just, unless we just want to keep rambling on for like another few hours. Depends how much work you need to do today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I got I got a call coming up here in about uh, less than ten minutes. So, uh, oh yeah, right. Actually, if you uh, if you want to. Um, if you ever want to revisit any of this stuff, feel free to have me back on, you know, because I'd, I'd be more than happy to talk, even if it's just about games and shit, because I'm, I'm always open to that. Yeah, too, oh, so. yeah, you can, you should, uh, you should guest on a, on a, a normal episode of the podcast, although, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, you'll have yeah. to, um, you'll have to have a listen and see if, uh, because by the sounds of it, you, you do appreciate the, the dark side of humor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. it's just, um, because we go a bit, like, quite dark. I'll, um, just uh, as a bit of self-promotion for anyone who um listening to this interview, because more often than not, um we get fans of the, the bands listening to the interviews that we've done, and I'm not, I've not been smart enough to go, oh, I should probably use this to actually promote the podcast and put some clips at the end to see if people might want to listen to the normal thing. So, um, <laughs> so I'll do that. So like you can listen, for example, if you want, or like, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. like, uh, any uh, Lauren guard fans who, who um, haven't heard this podcast before or whatever uh, can listen and see if me and Mike and Paul rambling is too horrible for them or not. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll but yeah, yeah. Your way once this once, when this post, we'll be uh, we'll put a link to it for you guys. Get some more attention. Awesome. So it's like yeah, um, yeah. You are more than welcome to come on a, on the on the main show when, when whenever you you're free because we just. More often than not, we we do record later on in the day, though. So just to warn you. Cool, cool. Sounds good. Yeah. Right. Anyway, we'll uh, we'll wrap it up here then. In that case, uh, thank you everyone for listening to this. Uh, like what started as an interview and ended as a ramble, as per usual. <laughs> uh, yep. yep. Uh, so if you want, if you do want to listen to to more, if you want a preview, listen after the end uh, after the Lauren Guard song. I'm going to play after this. Um, but uh, if you want to contact us, you can email 50footnerds at gmail.com or tweet us at 50footnerds. Um, you can tweet me, Mike, and Paul individually. I'm at Vault of Xtoff. Mike is at Mike G. Bell. And Paul is at Auton Scout. So, Brady, I don't know if you have a Twitter. Um, we do. We actually were at Lauren Guard, um, and then I have at Brady J. Sadler for for my personal like author site. But I don't. It's not very active. The Lauren Guard one's a little more active, and we're also just at LaurenGuard dot com, Facebook Lauren Guard, and uh, Lauren Guard at Gmail dot com. Yeah. So go to all those places and buy the book and the and the and the music and stuff. Oh, that was the the <laughs> as we're leaving. That's the one thing I remember. I was going to ask you. Uh, where can, yeah, where can I buy a physical CD of Eva Corruption? Um, it's actually uh, our label Cleopatra has it dis- distributed through most major distributors. So like oh, you okay. can get it online most places. Um, I think Amazon has a few copies left, maybe. But um, but they do appear in other like just any sort of random CD sites because uh, they. They have a pretty big distribution network. Um, we have a few left that we sell at shows, but most of it's in distribution with Cleopatra. Ah, uh, okay, fair enough. Because I've been I've been looking to buy a like that's the one thing I'm missing is a okay. So I'll, I'll, if I can't find a link, I'll see if I can send you one or something. We have we have some online, I believe. I'll I'll track one down for you. Awesome, thank you. No problem. So yeah, and uh, as for for everyone else, thank you for listening and uh, uh, geek out. I guess. Yeah, keep it up. Yep.
That was the 50-foot interview with Brady Sadler, a.k.a. Riken, from Lorengard. So, uh, I've just played one of their songs, Upon the Burning Isles, and uh, I couldn't choose between that and Hands of Chaos, so you're going to get both. Um, after this little bit of spiel here, uh, you're going to get Hands of Chaos, but before that, I'm going to give you guys and girls a sneak preview of... Well, I say sneak preview, this episode has been out already, but I'm going to give you guys and girls a clip of an existing attack of the 50 foot nerds show proper just so you can kind of hear the sort of um types of things we do and the general meandering that happens so i hope you enjoy that i'm thanking you uh, all for listening to this interview in the first place if you stick around cool if not that's cool too and uh, thank you for listening see ya <laughs> Um, hey, hey! You know what I want? Uh, I've been thinking about. You know how in the last ep- you know how hey, in the hey, last the episode we said we're now in the new fifty two. We rebooted are. our continuity. Yeah. You know what I really like about that? We can finally wear our underwear on the inside. I was doing that anyway. The fuck hell were you Me doing? Too. Well, in the old continuity, you, you know, just like Superman and Batman, we we were wearing our underpants on the outside. Who's we? <laughs> you got <laughs> tear in your pocket. <laughs> Anyway, 
Um, yes, this is Attack of the 50 Foot Nails podcast. It's Paul the Hobo. <laughs> 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 oh, safe way pass in my pants. <laughs> do you know what my name is? Super psychic. You got any change? Do you, do you know what my name is? Batman. <laughs> 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 Hobo versus Paul. I like no. to move it, move oh, it. Oh no, he's Eminem, isn't he? So it's Eminem versus Paul, Dawn of Justice. <laughs> <laughs> now that's a movie I want to see. Oh my god, that's a Photoshop job for later. Well, just uh, like Eminem and Paul. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know the perfect picture to use for Paul as well. Oh my god, it's amazing. Right. That's getting done later. Well, that reminds um, me, I still need pictures of all three of us so I can make us t-shirts. What? Why don't I make us... Why don't I make the Eminem versus Paul t- uh, picture and then you can put that on a t-shirt? Awesome. Yeah. Because, Paul, I was wanting... I was hoping before that we, we next met, I was... Uh, all you three mean of Thursday? Us. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, shh. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was hoping at some point to actually, like, find an appropriate picture, Paul, uh, of you and... Uh, turn up uh, next time we're in the same room together, just wearing a shirt with your face on it that just says, Eliza Dushku! <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a magic phrase, doesn't it? You know, like, oh, I'm I'm Eliza Eliza Dushku. <laughs> so Harry, your first lesson in the dark arts. You Eliza Dushku! Say, Eliza Dushku! <laughs> and so where a cannon goes off. <laughs> <laughs> What's the point of that, Uncle Valdi? <laughs> no reason. <laughs> okay, Uncle Valdi. <laughs> Still can't remember. <laughs> Doesn't matter. <laughs> you hit your head, Harry. That's how you got that scar. Honest. <laughs> Now give me the cocaine lodged between your buttocks and we'll party. <laughs> What's that you're waving at me? Oh, it's a rape stick. What's that? No, it's just the one, isn't it? You wait until tonight when you're asleep, then you'll find out it's a rape stick. <laughs> that night, Uncle Voldy... <laughs> that night, Uncle Uncle Voldy um, violated Harry with that wand. While in the other room, Harry and George did... Why was Harry... <laughs> Harry I mean, Fred and George. Was Fred, was, did Fred have the, the polyjuice potion on? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah Fred, Fred was uh, like, as Harry. Yeah, right, okay. He stole one of his pubes. It's not incest if he looks like someone else. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. He was yeah. trying to get... He was trying to get... Uh, he was trying to get Ron, but he got Harry instead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, freaking Fred and George. One of the one Luke creeps into the room and like wearing like a Groucho Marx glasses and a moustache. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> Fred, is that you? No, it's me, Groucho. Honest. <laughs> I've come oh, to I steal. Guess. I've come to steal some of your hair. Cha cha cha. <laughs> Take my hair, please. Um, you know. <laughs> well, he just comes in. Uh, he just comes in dressed as a frog. It's like, fucking... Like, he, steals some, a he steals some of uh, Harry's hair. Harry wakes up and is like, what's going on? He just goes... He just stares at him a second, then just starts going, hello, my baby! <laughs> jumps out the <laughs> That would be the weirdest fucking show ever. Oh, well, I thought, even better if, a movie. It'd be even better if someone took the concept of a frog going, hello, my baby, hello, my honey, and applied it to a creepy baby with superpowers. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Hey! Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anyways, we are the Attack of the 50 Foot Nerds, as I mentioned <laughs> 20 minutes ago. Um, <laughs> We do a podcast yeah, I've forgotten about sometimes, that. and uh, <laughs> you can get in touch with us. We're on Twitter at Fifty Foot Nerds, or email us anything you want us to talk about. So, but I'll be honest with you, we can probably make our own stuff up. Uh, Fifty Foot Nerds at Gmail dot com.
if you've enjoyed the nerddom in your ears, then please follow us on Twitter at at 50 foot nerds or email us anything except spam at 50 foot nerds at gmail.com.